allowed inside any building on Brown's campus. In the event of a fire alarm, please move calmly through any of the marked exits and move away from the building. Thank you for your cooperation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sylvia Carey Butler. I'm Vice President for Institutional Equity and Diversity here at Brown University. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to the second day of the um, symposium celebrating the lives and legacy of Lonnie Guineer and Bell Hooks. Today, today, we are celebrating Bell Hooks and we have such an esteemed um, um, group of scholars who are going to delve into Bell Hooks and what she means to them. Um, so um, I would like to also acknowledge our virtual audience. Um, I just know that the recording um, will be available, the live stream recording of this event and yesterday's will be available um, for your enjoyment and pleasure. Um, and we hope that the audience who's here with us today um, will take advantage of um, asking um, questions of our presenters. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first two panelists. Our first um, um, panel is going to be moderated by um, Dr. Um, Beverly Guy Sheftal. Um, Dr. Sheftal is the founding director of the Women's um, Resource, Research and Resource Center at Spelman College and the Anna Julian uh, Cooper um, Professor of Women's Studies at Spelman College. And for many years, she was a visiting professor at Emory University's Institute for Women's um, Studies, where she taught graduate um, courses in women's studies. I do want to share this. I, you know, normally I wouldn't read someone's whole bio, but Dr. Sheftal is bad, so, so I really do want to read her whole bio. At the age of 16, she entered Spelman, 16. She entered Spelman College where she majored in English and minored in secondary education. And after graduating with honors, she attended Wellesley College for a fifth year of study in English. In 1968, she entered uh, Atlanta, um, she entered Atlanta to pursue a master's degree in English. Her thesis was entitled, Faulkner's treatment of women in his major novels. A year later, she began her first teaching job in the Department of English at Alabama State University in Montgomery, Alabama. In 1971, she returned to her alma mater, Spelman um, College, and joined the English department there. She has published numerous um, um, texts within the African uh, American Women's Studies, which has been a noted and seminal works by other scholars, including the first anthology on Black women's literature, um, Sturdy Black Bridges, one of my favorite, um, Visions of Black Women in Literature, um, which she co-edited um, with Roseanne P. Bell and Betty Parker Smith. Um, her dissertation, Daughters of Sorrow, um, you all should be taking notes about books you should want to read. <laughs> an anthology of African-American feminist thought um, and an anthology she co-edited with uh, Rudolf Byrd entitled Traps, African-American Men on the Gender Sexuality, um, uh, um, African Men on Gender and Sexuality, a book co-authored with um, Janetta Cole, Gender Talk, The Struggle for Women, Equality in African-American Communities. Um, and an, an anthology, I Am Your Sisters, um, collect, uh, I Am Your Sister, a collected unpublished um, anthology written, uh, writings of Andre, um, Audre Lorde and co-edited it with Rudolph Byrd and Jeanetta Cole, clearly a prolific scholar. Um, and, and her most recent publication is an anthology co-edited with Jeanetta Cole, Who Should Be First, Feminist Speak, um, uh, out on a 2008 presidential campaign. And in 1983, she became the founding co-editor of SAGE, a scholarly journal of Black women, which was devoted exclusively to the experiences of women of African descent. She is the past president of the National Women's Studies Association and was elected to the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences in 2018. Please welcome to the stage, Beverly Guy Sheffield. Joining us virtually is Shade, Shade um, Malaku. 
And Dr. Malik, who is the founding and inaugural director of the Bell Hook Center for the Chair and Chair of Women and Gender Sexuality Studies at Berea College, and drawing on the teachings of Black feminist scholars, a very similar um, to Dr. Sheftal, um, um, Malaku's writings practice and pedagogy interrogate enlightenment, um, Europe's so, Europe social and political constructions of time, which locate white men characterized by masculinity and mastery at the apex of human civilization. The converse, uh, Malaku regularly publishes in, uh, in think pieces, most recently in The Conversationalist, The Feminist Wire, Counterpunch, and as a correspondent. Um, prior to joining Berea College, Malaku served as assistant professor and acting chair of critical identity studies at Beloit College. Uh, Malaku currently serves, and she's got a lot of other appointments in there. Uh, Malaku um, currently serves as a visiting faculty in the Center for Expanded Poetics at Concordia University um, in Montreal. She received her PhD in culture and theory and graduate certificates in critical theory and feminist studies from the University of California and, and, and 20, um, Irvine in 2016 and her BA in cultural anthropology and women's studies from Duke University in um, 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Malaku, and I really hope that I got that last part right because there were two dates there. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. It's Malaklu, but please call me Shadi. Okay. Good morning. So thank you, Sylvia. Um, I just want to say how happy I am to be here. Uh, and Shadi and I have, have crafted this session uh, to focus on an aspect of Bell Hooks' life and legacy at Berea College, which I think probably people know uh, less about. and. And we're going to start with a 12 minute uh, tape of her commencement speech at Berea. We want to bring her into the room. And then Shadi is going to talk about Bell at uh, Berea. And then I'm going to talk about my relationship with Bell and particularly her impact on our students at Spelman and the Institute. So I would say that this session is going to be about friendship feminism, and institution building. Chadi. Thank you, Beverly. It's such a pleasure, honor, and privilege to be a part of this conversation. I'm sorry I could not attend in person. Uh, I thank Sylvia and, and Brown for making a virtual visit possible. Jake, can we play the video? <laughs> This is from 2014. This is Bell's commencement address at Bria College. Years, I ran away from Kentucky, convinced as I was that there was no place for a radical wild woman like me to belong here. Ultimately, I came home to Kentucky because all that I loved remained constant here. Family, the hills where I roamed in my girlhood, the bluegrass beauty, the vernacular speech of backwood folks, all of me that matters, all of who I am, spiritual seeker, intellectual writer, feminist critic, was a seed planted in the soil of Kentucky. Here is where I live, and here is where my body will return to earth nurturing seeds for future harvest. It is with profound joy and a sense of deep inner peace that I often sit at my desk writing in Berea, looking out at magnificent oak trees. The natural world outside my window restores my soul, my sense of belonging. To commune with nature is an essential aspect of spiritual journeying. In his book, Callings, Finding and Following an Authentic Life, Greg Lavoy reminds us that nature is a proper setting for a return to ourselves, our source, our place of origin. It is the place where the world was created, where our ancestors come from. By going back to nature, we are, in a sense, returning to the garden, to the place where we were contained within nature's wholeness. 
where we were not separated from the divine, from whence our visions and calls emanated. Guided by prophetic vision, we understand that it is the interdependent wholeness of life we are called to celebrate, cherish, and preserve. By prophetic vision, I mean simply divinely inspired imagining of new and different possibilities. Vision requires imagination, the ability to see what cannot be seen. In The Soul of Politics, Jim Wallace reminds readers that the prophetic vision is to challenge the old while announcing the new. Like the prophets, we must call certainty into question. The biblical prophets always had a twofold task. First, they were to be bold in telling the truth and proclaiming justice. But in addition to truth telling, the prophets had a second task. They held up an alternative vision. They helped the people to imagine new possibilities. Each age produces its own prophets. Those who are gifted with a greater than ordinary spiritual, ethical, and moral insight, who articulate divinely inspired revelations. Studying the life of Berea's founder, John Fee, it is evident that he had a prophetic vision. In retrospect, we can look back in awe and wonder that in one of the most extreme social climates of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy our nation has known, Fee dared to answer a divinely inspired spiritual call to create what Dr. Martin Luther King would call a beloved community, a revolution of values. We are called to cultivate both individually and collectively a spirit of radical openness, one that strengthens our collective willingness to be bold in telling the truth and hearing the truth. Commitment to truth telling requires conscious practice, a willingness to have congruency between what we think and do, a willingness to be people of integrity. Most of us learn the value of integrity in spiritual and or religious settings. Spiritual life is first and foremost about commitment to a way of thinking and behaving that honors principles of interbeing and interconnectedness. When I speak of the spiritual, I refer to the recognition within everyone that there is a place of mystery in our lives that are beyond forces that are beyond human desire or will that alter circumstances. A commitment to spiritual life necessarily means we embrace that love is all, everything, our true destiny. We are here to love. Despite overwhelming pressure to, the, to conform to the culture of lovelessness, we all seek to know love. That seeking is itself a manifestation of spirit. Life-threatening nihilism abounds in contemporary culture, crossing the boundaries of race, class, sexuality, gender, nationality, and religion. At some point, it impacts all our lives. Everyone in this room has been at times brought low by feelings of depression, despondency, and despair about the state of the world. Whether it is the ongoing worldwide presence of violence, expressed by the persistence of man-made war, genocide, hunger, starvation, the day-to-day -day violence and hatreds, racism, sexism, homophobia, or the presence of life-threatening diseases that cause the unexpected death of friends, comrades, and loved ones. There is much that can bring us all to the brink of despair. Knowing love or the hope of knowing love can help us keep a hold on life. Love defined as a combination of care, commitment, knowledge, responsibility, respect, and trust. Insightfully, Buddhist teacher Jack Hornfield explains, all other spiritual teachings are in vain if we cannot love. Even the most exalted states and the most exceptional spiritual accomplishments are unimportant 
if we cannot be happy in the most basic and ordinary ways, if with our hearts we cannot touch one another and the life we have been given, what matters is how we live. We are here to love. Throughout my graduate school years, as I worked hard to finish my doctorate, striving to maintain a commitment to spiritual life in an academic and intellectual setting where the needs of the spirit were devalued and denied, I found strength in remaining open to love. Not everyone here today is a believer. Not everyone here has a spiritual practice, but hopefully we can all agree that there are powers at work in the world beyond the scope of human will and human action. Our survival as a people and as a planet demands recognition of the power of Holy Spirit, however that makes itself named, known, and felt in your life. To honor the awesome power of spirit, it is essential that each of you nurture your inner life, for that is the ground of your being, what some of us call soul. Remember, always, graduates, that what you know matters, but who you are matters more. Do not be so focused on success, money, status, fun, all the temptations of this world that you neglect to care for your soul, that you forget to love. Love connects and liberates us. No matter our place in imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal culture, when we do the work of love, we are doing the work of ending domination. The process of becoming whole and wholehearted requires us to love. If you are seeking a spiritual foundation for your life, or if you are simply longing to live a meaningful life, love can guide you, empowering you to create a constructive plan, a map that can take you wherever you want to go. If you believe as I do in divine calling, that there is a divinely ordained plan for each of our lives, being loving will direct your path, enable you to find your calling, Love will compel you to grow emotionally, revealing and unfolding each step along the way, critical awareness and critical thinking about what you must do and how you must live. Recently, a spiritual friend shared with me his understanding that your heart has to be ready to handle the weight of your calling. There will be times in your life when you will face adversity, when you will suffer, when you will know sorrow, when your heart will break. There will be times, alternatively, when you, like the biblical Jonah, will hear the divine calling and refuse to answer. When you will talk back to your higher powers saying, don't call me, call someone else. When we resist our calling, we falter, we fail, we fall. With courage and compassion, that graduates dare to make your heart ready to receive the gift of your calling. Trust in the power of love. My belief that we are here to love, that this is our purpose, our reason for being sustains me. I affirm this belief through daily meditation and prayer, through contemplation and service, through worship and loving kindness. Connect with the needs of your spirit. It is this connectedness that calls us to love. In the biblical book of John, we are told, anyone who does not know love is still in death. I urge you graduates, Live fully, start right now. Start right now where you are, be loving. Thank you, Jake. I wanted to start by explaining why Beverly and I chose to open today's conversation with Bell's commencement address. 
we felt that it was especially important at a time you know, of her passing when intellectuals and institutions are trying to invoke Bell's message of love as a means of defanging and depoliticizing her more dissident interventions. To remember that Bell calls on us to love ourselves and to love each other fiercely, unapologetically, because doing so is the way to justice, not in the liberal pluralist sense in which we add color and gender and mix, but rather because in Bell's own words, quote, love connects and liberates us, no matter our place in imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal culture, when we do the work of love, we are doing the work of ending domination. In 1999, Berea College's Women's Studies Program, since renamed the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department, invited Bell to deliver a campus-wide convocation address. Bria hosts at least one convocation speaker each month, and students are required to attend these events each term as a condition of their graduation. Bell chose to speak on the topic of love and spirituality, explaining, as she does in the video we just witnessed, that, quote, if you are seeking a spiritual foundation for your life, or if you simply uh, long to live a meaningful life, love can guide you. Drawn to Berea's anti-racist uh, anti beginnings as the first interracial and co-educational college in the South, founded, as she notes in the video, by radical abolitionists like John G. Fee, and wishing to return to her Kentucky home place, Bell joined the faculty in 2004. Explaining her decision, uh, Bell said, quote, I felt very much that I wanted to give back to the world I came from. I grew up in the hills of Kentucky, and I wanted these students to see you can be a cosmopolitan person of the world, but still be connected positively to your home roots. She also chose Berea as the site for the Bell Hooks Institute, which preserves Bell's legacy through art and artifacts from her life. The Institute's inaugural event, held September 7th, 2015, featured trans artist, activist, uh, actress Laverne Cox, who is credited with adding cis and heteronormative to Bell's call to dismantle imperialist white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Since then, the Institute has hosted prominent visitors, including Cornel West, Gloria Steinem, Imani Perry, Darnell Moore, and even pop culture personalities like Emma Watson. These intimate talks, which were open to the campus and community, reflected Bell's belief that truth-telling can transform consciousness and communities. Uh, Bell explains, quote, we must be bold in telling the truth and in hearing the truth. In 2015, she donated her papers to Berea College's Special Collections and Archives. Her monumental gift of letters, manuscripts, memorabilia, gives students and researchers insight into her life, love, and feminist legacy. Beginning in fall 2019, when I accepted the position as chair of what is now Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Berea and tasked with opening a gender inclusive center, Bell and I schemed together about founding a center in her name. The center was to be different from the Institute that while housed at Berea, she wanted to be freestanding. Uh, it's, uh, the center's built environment and feminist programming were designed to serve the students that Bell felt most connected to. Students of color, women students and gender non-binary students who were and remain in need of a space where they can, as our website states, quote, come to be as they are outside of the social scripts that circumscribe their living. Bell and I collaborated on a multimedia display for the center that tells the story of Berea's founding and future as an abolitionist college committed to interracial and gender inclusive education. Um, the history as well of the, of the department and its evolution, which is informed by the work of the center, and importantly, her own love, life, and legacy in Berea, in Appalachia, and in the world. We dreamt together about revising the outdated curriculum of what was then women's and gender studies, made up at the time of coursework committed to telling white women's stories only, inclusive of courses like, quote, riding the waves and gender and Western civilization. The new curriculum we established after much pushback from the college's governing structure, as well as colleagues who should have known better, engages anti-colonial feminisms, 
queer and trans theory, black feminist theory, feminist and queer disability studies, and the use and abuse of what Jennifer Nash describes as quote, intersectionality and its dis slash contents. It was important to me that the center be beautiful. Uh, Jake, would you mind showing some of the videos of uh, images of the center? Uh, it was important to me that it be beautiful, adorned, for example, uh, with the original commissioned artists you see on the left, um, and with, you know, I'm, I'm Iranian, so I brought in Persian, Turkish, and Afghan rugs. And the center as well is size inclusive and ADA friendly, so that our students, most of whom live at the intersections of socioeconomic oppression, racism, sexism, homo and transphobia, fat phobia, ableism, and the like, would know that they are and we are committed to making them feel safe and seen. Uh, would you mind showing the next image, Jake? Thank you. Um, I also wanted to create a space that encourages Berea College students to become social justice leaders, following in Bell's legacy, uh, to speak plainly and personally about the way the world works and their place in it, so that they can imagine and enact new relationships that change this world. The center's programming, like its flagship Gender Talk speaker series, modeled after Beverly's iconic book by the same name, its student activist series, um, it's artists and residency series, as well as some of the resources we make available, for example, um, menstrual products, contraceptives, pronoun pins, rainbow masks, um, the names and contact information of uh, local queer friendly healthcare practitioners, um, and, and student made anti institution zines and other publications. Uh, uh, these um, aim to support students' gender expressions beyond the binary, including their queer of color experiences and to making feminism available um, and appealing to everybody, regardless of gender. We feel called by this commitment, especially in moments when Berea College fails to live up to its own motto and mission to quote, make of one blood all peoples of the earth. Jake, would you mind showing the rest of the images? You can go to the next one, thank you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, Bell wanted very much to participate in the center's launch festivities, um, but was by then very sick, uh, not wanting to expose, as she writes in, quote, being the subject of art, her, quote, body in pain, uh, herself, quote, trapped in a body that is letting her down again and again. She asked media not to attend the event. In the end, Bell was too ill to make it, but was very happy that Beverly, her longtime friend and confidant, the bestie who called her Gloria, um, who went to the store, in, uh, store from store in Atlanta to find Belle the perfect black skirt, and she was very picky. She did not like synthetic fibers. Um, who each week sent Belle a new box of magazines to read, which we scoured together for positive images of black and brown women. Beverly was very um, gracious and generous to speak to our community about their relationship at the launch. Speaking personally, I was fortunate to sit with Belle almost daily in the final years of her life. When I arrived at her doorstep in fall 2019 with the bouquet of flowers that I could not afford, um, Belle told me that she didn't like flowers, she did, uh, and then continued to say with a, a trademark nod and wink and smile that she was actually originally against my hire at Berea College. When I asked her why, she remarked, that she could not imagine a woman of Iranian descent finding home in Berea. From then on, I was her Iranian. At other times, she called me, quote, a prophet of doom, someone who thought too critically at the expense of my joy, forsaking love. I think Belle saw in my quarrel with institutional inequity some of herself and what the academy took from her, and it did take from her. Belle recounted that when she fell ill, it felt as though a balloon had popped and deflated. She attributed this to the unsustainable rate at which she wrote and taught. She was concerned that I was doing the same. Belle didn't talk theory with me, she gossiped, though I would soon learn that the two were one and the same. She learned to enact love as a verb, as radical truth-telling, to what she describes as the, quote, hillbilly country folk who uh, were her uh, ancestors and kin in the, quote, Kentucky Black Woods, 
in her rural black communities in formal, ordinary and vernacular ways of care. Bell's gossip was her truth, uh, was her truth telling, a homegrown way to curate honest, uh, sorry, to carry, I've lost my love, uh, homegrown way to curate honest, intentional and yes, beloved community. Bell never hesitated to tell you what's what. I was not spared her critique and nor was anyone else. When I could not find the strength to leave an abusive relationship, Belle called me a bad feminist and she meant it. She told me and anyone who would listen that I love too much and too hard and that I should never have married a white man who was using me to find a way out of his whiteness. Belle's truth telling required that I also be bold in quote hearing the truth and in letting others hear it too. She wasn't just airing my dirty laundry. Her hard truths held up a mirror to what I didn't want to see but needed to know if I was to, as Tony, as Tony K. Bambara implores, quote, get my house in order. Bell explained that loving too much and too hard wasn't my problem. Far from it. Rather, she was concerned that selfless love had made me an implement of white futurity. Bell's lessons on the page and in person were lessons in self-love and how we get free from profound pain. She writes, quote, I came to theory because I was hurting. The pain within me was so intense that I could not go on living. I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp what was happening around and within me. Most importantly, I wanted to make the hurt go away. I saw in theory then a location for healing. If Bell's gossip was her theory, it was also a location for my healing. Her revolutionary M slash othering or mothering, uh, which is uh, Alexis Pauling Gum's turn of phrase, her quote, nurturing work and survival dance as a quote, chosen and accidental mother, provided spaces of self-love that helped me to cultivate a patch of green, a garden, as she notes, um, where I could lay down my heavy, heavy head and bruised heart in beloved community with those persons who Bell trusted to hold my pain with the loving kindness that I needed to heal to love myself. A feminist killjoy, I originally struggled to enact Bell's love ethic. I was, as Bell scolded me, strident. I wanted to set the world on fire so that something new could grow from its ashes in its wake. What I wanted was the madness of freedom. What Jared Sexton describes as, quote, a mad freedom where there is none. What I learned, what I wanted uh, was the new beginning that Frantz Fanon writes as an, uh, writes about and calls an invention, galvanized by the stridency of those who demand it. Bell taught me that love, a strident, urgent, anarchic love assembled, as Sadia Hartman might write in a, quote, riotous manner, a love that loves too much and too hard, but in the interest of self-actualization is what will strike the match that burns down the master's house. Bell writes that love is rage is, quote, profoundly political. She elaborates, quote, our deepest revolution will come when we understand this truth. In the days and nights since her transition, I've sat with Bell's lesson, understanding now that mad freedom requires mad love. It is love without direction, love that is out of control, love without recourse to rationality and reason that baptizes us, the quote, wretched of the earth as gardeners and guardians of that earth, tasked uh, with using our blood and sweat to fertilize freedom for ourselves and for other others in ways that provoke apocalyptic epistemological catastrophe for a white supremacist version of man. Promising then not white futurity, but futurity for the earth and for us. Only love can cultivate this garden of possibility. They try to bury us, the saying goes, not knowing we are seeds. Bell haunts me still, reminding me to go where the love is, provoking me to use love as the ethical demand for an otherwise in which all life matters where we can creatively repurpose the quote sunken places of our psychic assaults to as Fanon notes leap towards other possibilities of living in ways that enact what feminist theorist Karen Barad describes as quote responsibility and what Bell describes as interbeing. Um, 
love is a verb and as a verb, as an action, an intention, a possibility, a choice, a community, and accountability to ourselves, to each other, and to the earth that sustains us is what will save us. Love is active. Self-love especially activates us to leap towards what we do not know and which we cannot name, but which we want and feel and reach for anyway. Thank you. Beverly? <laughs> Thanks, Shadi. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes, and I decided that I'm going to read from something that I wrote that is now published, and then I'm going to end with um, something that one of our students, Moya Bailey, uh, who invented the term Mickey Sojin War, wrote in an, in an essay called Feminism, Friendship, and Fury. And, and, and we want to really leave some room at the end for Q&A. My friendship with Gloria Watkins, she was not yet bell hooks and I never called her anything but Gloria, began at the 1981 National Women's Studies Association Conference in Storrs, Connecticut, during which Audre Lorde delivered that groundbreaking, hard hitting keynote speech, the uses of anger, women responding to racism, in which she spoke about the racism of white women, and the NWSA where eventually I got to be president. It was the same year, 1981, that the Women's Research and Resource Center at Spelman, I founded. And Gloria was our most frequent visitor, even when I didn't have honoraria. When Gloria was at stores, this is hard to believe, uh, she was walking around with a flyer trying to promote her first book, Ain't I a Woman? And she didn't have money enough to have a hotel, a dormitory room. So I told her she can come in my pitiful single room. I would sleep on the floor and she could have my, my, room, my bed. We shared that dormitory room, literally talked all night, all night. We talked about the whiteness of the women's movement, we talked about the US, we talked about NWSA, and we talked about our lives as Southern Black women, both of whom had majored in English in college and got a degree in English and became passionate, passionate about feminist politics. We also talked about the dissonant women in our own lives, her, grandmother, great-grandmother, and my mother. In fact, the first feminist I ever knew was my own mother. So over, what, 40 years of Bell Hooks and I talked, argued, broke up, got back together, and I was with her as Shadi was uh, during the last week of her life. And I tried to talk her into staying here, but she wouldn't. What I came to cherish about the embrace of a dissonant feminist identity, I learned from reading and talking endlessly to Gloria and arguing, which of course began that night at NWSA. Like another dissonant scholar activist, Angela Davis, and the architects of the Combahee River Collective statement, Bell Hooks emerges from a robust African-American left tradition, which is anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, and critical of patriarchy, wherever it rears its head, including in our own communities. Near the beginning of talking back, Bell acknowledges Angela Davis's impact on her as a young, evolving, dissident, feminist, intellectual activist. And this is what she said. When I was a young scholar for the revolution, Angela Davis spoke those words. They moved me. I say them here and hope to say them in many places. 
This is how deeply they touched me, meaning Angela's words, evoking memories of innocence, of initial passionate commitment to political struggle. Bell Hooks' transgressive writings would have a significant impact on my evolving scholarship. In her first monograph on Black women and feminism, she made the surprising point that 19th century white female reformers harbored more intense racist attitudes toward Black women than they did toward Black men, which is ironic in light of the bonds of, bond of womanhood thesis, which many other white feminist historians advance, many of you in this room remember, in their attempts to explain alliances between black and white women in various reform movements. And she has a long and provocative explanation about why this was the case, which I won't share. If I could speak to Gloria one more time, I would tell her what it meant to share a long friendship with a dissident feminist intellectual. Observing her and reading her feminist books, as well as having the example of my mother and her great grandmother, I found it easier to resist stifling gender norms in both my personal and professional lives as it related to appropriate behavior but so-called good ladylike women. I journeyed to distant and unfamiliar places, sometimes alone, sometimes not alone, wore the clothes I wanted to wear, studied the transgressive black women I wanted to be like, Lorraine, Alice, Angela, Evelyn, Audrey, took unpopular stances, always refused to be quiet in public, especially at Spelman, risked being understood, chose the friendships and partnerships I desired, advocated loudly for my passions, fears I might have harbored about being too aggressive, the stereotypical angry black woman or gender nonconforming had to be abandoned. I am very fortunate, as are many of us, to have lived the life I wanted to live. And Belle was one of my examples. Like so many, I am grateful for her life and work. Now I want to end my part of it. And Shadi, we can maybe have a little conversation before we end this part. This is, this is more difficult than I thought, talking. So anyway, I want to I want to I want to really underscore the impact that Bell Hooks had at Spelman College uh, and on, on and on our students. On January 29, 2004, while a student at Spelman College, I apparently, but I didn't realize it, had the best day ever of my life. In my personal live journal, this is Amoya Bailey, as I mentioned, a digital diary. I gave quick recaps of my days to remember what I'd done with my time. It was a way to track the moments that mattered to me and a way to connect and share my day-to-day -day with my high school friends who were at their own institutions and had their own live journals. I, I was inspired to read this by a lot of what was said yesterday in terms of the importance of intimate spaces like this one. There is nothing like sitting at the feet of a black woman who feels comfortable enough, enough to curse and say all kinds of things. <laughs> Not that Bell Hook seemed to have any trouble doing that, but, at, but she did it more relaxed and a little deeper at the chairs, in the chairs at Spelman, sipped an extra glass of wine and took her shoes off in public. <laughs> Because of the divine timing of the universe, I was privy to the friendship, fellowship, and fury of Bell Hooks' connection to Beverly. I sat at Hooks' feet on the many occasions that she came to campus during my tenure and afterwards. 
This essay engages the quiet moments that happen before the stage and after the stage and in the intimate space of the Spelman Women's Center. I argue that Black women's intimate spaces make friendship, fellowship, and fury possible. And that the conversations held in such spaces have much to teach us about how we relate to each other now and in our futures. The friendship, fellowship, and fury between those two was the stuff of legend for us fledgling feminists. We learned so much by simply sharing that space. The lessons I learned are some I will never forget. And then I think I would just want to read one more. Uh, and this is just the last one. And you, you have no idea, I have no idea. Hmm? Their friendly banter and raucous laughter left us in awe. I mean, we would sit, you know, we would, I mean, it was amazing. How cool was that, that our uh, professor had such an amazing friend? We read her work in our classes and not just in the courses that Beverly taught. The presence of bell hooks, whether, phys whether physically on campus or through her written words was felt far and wide at Spelman. And then at the end, she finally says, um, we simply loved and adored Belle. And so I wanna end my formal conversation with that student and the impact that she had uh, when she would come on a regular basis. How much time do we have? About 30 minutes. How much? 30 minutes. Okay. So Shadi, do you want to say anything else before we open it up? Yeah. I, you know, when you told me about, or when you spoke about Bell's critique of white women, I was reminded of her speech at the 2014 NWSA meeting in Puerto Rico, two years or so before Trump, right? And she says, when given the choice, white women will always choose their race before their gender. And then of course, Trump was voted in by many white women's votes. Um, and then I was thinking about this intimate space, uh, you know, uh, provocation that Moya Bailey offers us and the quiet moments. And uh, something that Belle started at Berea was something called, she initially called it group and then she called it sister circle. And she would invite um, the women both at the college and in the community that she felt fellowship with to come and be together. We would pick a passage of poetry we wanted to read. We would share uh, personal stories as political testaments. Um, and these spaces to, as a testament to Bell's generosity included white women. Um, and you know, when I, would, when I would talk to Bell and I would call her a staple of black feminism, she would say, I'm not a black feminist, I'm a feminist. Right? She didn't want to be additive uh, to what we think of as feminism. And I also thought that was very generous because I think of feminism as a white woman's movement that we need to rephrase, right? To think about uh, non-white uh, women experiences. And then I think about our curriculum and it was hard, hard won. And the people who came after us were white women colleagues who taught classes like on a, American girlhood uh, to list one example. And they came for us and said, well, are, are you just calling all, uh, all white women colonizers? And of course we weren't, but it was telling that because our curriculum included classes, for example, on anti-colonial feminism and black feminism, that white women felt threatened, felt you know that they were being outed, even though they were not named. So I wonder often how to make community and common unity, to borrow Karen Barad's term, and interbeing, as Bell says, uh, following Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings, with white women, because I fear I fear also that they are more dangerous than white men, that the way they play up fragility, right? Um, and the way that that provokes a kind of a national alarm, um, that that is very dangerous. And I, I and that's a lesson I'm trying to, to figure out. Uh, thank you, uh, Beverly, for bringing that up. I think it's a good discussion point. 
I, you know, I could talk forever, but let's let's open this up and have some dialogue, conversation, responses. Hey, I think we can hear you though. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. And and tell us who you are too, please. You know what? She could stop talking. I could repeat it. Okay. Why don't you start? Okay, hold on, I think that's too long for me to repeat. So she's gonna. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I'll have to remember my question. Okay, no. So start, start all over. So uh, the audience, not us. Yes. People. Okay. Okay, starting all over. Thank you very much, um, both of you, for a very inspiring uh, presentation. My name is Shireen Saad. I'm a professor of arts journalism here at Brown in this building. And I was really thinking about the connections you drew between radical love, the feminist killjoy, and, um, and then thinking about how to connect these two um, and how to overcome the sunken place and the idea of solidarity when we are living in the white gaze and for the white gaze. So how do we build this solidarity and how do we sort of, how can we be heard, right? Um, as feminist killjoys. So there's all these connections that personally I'm kind of struggling to, um, to build because I'm feeling very stuck in this work personally. Thank you very much. Shadi, you wanna take that? Sure. Um, so I was trained, as Sylvia mentioned, at the University of California, Irvine, in culture and theory. And while I was there, it was it became a very pessimistic study. Um, there's a there's a strain of thought called Afro pessimism. And I call myself a recovering Afro pessimist um, because I do think that women of color have made, especially black women, have made some of these arguments um, and that we need to, to cite them in the ways that we want to create this other world. Um, but I am a pessimist. And, and I, I say that, you know, giggling with Belle and the coloring her hair in the kitchen and we would Etsy shop, window shop for Turkish rugs for her house. And these these community building uh, practices with her uh, disabuse me of my pessimism. And what I've been trying to do is, is marry the two, marry this this hopeful possibility with a really critical perspective on the way the world works. And I am a Fanonian um, and I do believe that. Uh, the way the world works needs to be burned to the ground, right? But following Bell, I think that it needs to happen with um, sustainable love. And so the way that I have tried to make sense of, um, of this is, is through this idea of um, forsaking uh, a current world order. Sylvia Winter says that we are kind of trapped by the semantically neurochemically induced performative enactment or of our always already role allocated uh, collective and individual behaviors. And that's a loose quote. Um, but thinking with her and then with Fanon, who in the conclusion of Black Skin White Mask, quotes Marx's concept of poetry from the future. And he describes this poetry as one that we can perceive, but which exceeds common senses and therefore cannot recognize, right? We cannot name it. We cannot recognize or see it because the white geese isn't just out there, it's in here, right? It is literally built in sociogenically into our consciousness. And so we need to find on instructs leap, right? But that leap cannot have a landing because if we name that landing, 
then we are again reproducing the semantically neurochemically induced uh, status of what we think the world should be, right? We have this toolbox or this repository of ideas and we're just applying them, right? So we're not dismantling the master's house. We're just putting someone new or some new concept um, at the forefront. And so I, I really do want to think about what, what friend Moten describes as the elsewhere and else when of our freedom dreams, right? Again, something we can perceive and dream of and feel and maybe even taste. Well, we can't describe it to someone, right? Um, when Bell talks about spirituality, uh, she says something similar in the beginning of what we watch. Uh, she says, um, uh, she says, I want to try to find it. She talks about prophetic vision, right? Um, divine inspired imagining uh, that creates new and different possibilities. Uh, the ability, she says, to see what cannot be seen. And the other thing Bell does, which I think is, is brilliant and not credited, is she thinks with the earth, right? At one point, I think in, in um, a book I'm not remembering, uh, but she, she writes that um, when we love the earth, we are able to love ourselves more fully. The ancestors taught me it was so. So how do we think beyond a kind of humanism, right? That is, uh, is the, is the um, preferred subject of the world, right? This notion of a role and moil of event leading to this apex of civilization or in, uh, apex of being. Um, and, you know, blackness is always backwards. And those of us who are non-black people of color sometimes get white privilege or human passing and sometimes do not. Uh, how do we move past that teleological becoming, right? To exist with nature in nature, uh, to uh, also want futurity for the birds and the skies and the trees. I think about um, the revolution currently happening in, happening in Iran uh, around what they describe as women life liberty. And the song Baroye that won the, the Golden Globe or I'm sorry, Grammy Award uh, as a social justice song sings very interestingly about this. Um, he says, this is not just for women's rights. This is for um, the polluted air, the dying trees, the missing and murdered street dogs, right? So, so revolution can be a site where we think capaciously about saving the earth and forsaking the world. And I'm a theorist more than an activist. And I, I, I struggle and I'm still learning how to put that into praxis um, with sustainable love. I don't know if that helps answer your question. So I, I would just briefly say, um, no matter what is going on in the world or at the institution where I work or in any spaces where I am, half of the day, I am joyful. <laughs> and I am joyful because of my loving friendships. It, it, it is loving friendships that sustain me. And I would say that over my... 40-year friendship with Bell, most of what we did was laugh and shop <laughs> and gossip and shop and, um, you know, talk about readings. I mean, the magazine stuff. She knew I was a magazine addict. And I'm not talking, I mean, I would, you know, all kinds of magazines. And we would, we would talk about, we would talk about magazines. And so, um, that's what that that is what I what I would say. And, and, and I learned this from my mother. My mother said, if you do not have close women friends, you will not survive. You will not survive in this world. And I saw her and she, she stayed a, a close friend with the person she was in the first grade with. And uh, one of the things I think Shadi and I are unhappy about is that Belle didn't have to go. I, I, I want to say this. People have asked all kinds of questions. She did not have a terminal illness. Uh, she did not have any of the normal things to take Black women out. Uh, she chose. She chose not to have medical treatment. And when I asked her and said to her, do you understand, Gloria, what the impact of your decision is, she said, yes. And so one of the things that I learned from that is I hope that if I get to that point uh, in my life and a very, very close friend and I have talked about it, I will choose the circumstances under which I will depart. And I hope that I have a loving friend 
that I can have this conversation with. So I would say loving friendships, particularly with kinfolk. And by kinfolk, I mean people who share your politics and your forever behavior of resistance. I mean, that is what sustains me. Uh, and I, I hear in my head one of my African feminist friends, Patricia McFadden, she said, Beverly, every day of my life, I try to be more radical than I was the day before. More radical than I was the day before. And so every day of my life, I try to do something, even if it's tiny. Uh, and that's what, I, so I don't have despair. I have, I have gratefulness for having chosen the life that I chose, which is to teach Black feminism at a historically Black college for women and to have loving friends. Well, Evelyn's got her, yeah. So uh, thank you both for these really beautiful, incredible uh, reflections on, 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 on Bell. And I can't help but think about how much I've been reminded in the last month of, of the new ongoing Civil War 2.0 that has occurred and we are a part of, and how many times when they start naming the books that should be banned, the idea she is all, Bell Hook's name is always mentioned, as well as our other good feminist uh, comrade, um, Kim Crenshaw, uh, uh, and Angela Davis. There are actually more Black women's names right. mentioned in these attacks than there are any other folks. And so I want to see if you, if, if what you guys would, ref, uh, the two of you would reflect on in terms of, you know, at this particular moment, why her work has sort of surfaced as the absolute central target of the people who are uh, waging this Civil War 2.0 against us and, and what that means about her work, her presence, her legacy, but also if you might, uh, what do you think she would be saying today? Before I answer that, one thing I, re I really wanna say and it reminded me of something somebody said yesterday. Bell Hooks thought she would, would not be remembered. Exactly. Yes. Bell Hooks thought, that she, re she reminded me of what happened to Zora Neale Hurston, who was forgotten, penniless, and I glory knew she wouldn't be penniless, but forgotten, uh, demonized. And of course, it was Alice Walker who found her unmarked grave and put a marker on it. So despite, <laughs> I think she would be stunned, she would be stunned and she would probably say, I'm one of the ones that, that, that you know whose books uh, are taken off and who's because she actually really did think, uh, which is one of the reasons she wanted to have the uh, institute there that she was not going to be remembered at all. So I just wanted to say that first. But Shadi, um, respond to Evelyn first. Um, okay, so I in the later years of her life, especially that last year, Bell really bemoaned what she felt was the absence of feminism. And she wasn't really, you know, she didn't have a, she didn't have a, a phone, a, a smartphone. She had a, a, a house line um, and she didn't really look at the computer. So I would go and scroll through Twitter and tell her what was happening. I think, like Beverly said, she would be surprised that her books are being banned because of, <laughs> because Belle was, was very radical, but she was also remarkably generous and inclusive. And I don't think that that is taken into account. When she and I talked, again, we gossiped. The personal was very political. And she was my closest confidant here. So when, as I mentioned, my marriage was falling apart, um, I would often be with her uh, to process. Um, it was kind of the only space I had at Berea, not just outside of my home space, but outside of a white gaze um, as, you know, a, a panopticon. Uh, and as the 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 um, the the definite um, fishbowl of being in a college town, and my my ex husband actually convinced himself that he was Native American, one of these you know people that are now outed as a pretendian. So I'm happy to be through with that relationship. 
But as we were talking and making sense of it, she said something that I think is really um, relevant to your question. And we were talking about how this, this kind of democratization of um, intersectionality, for example, this idea that it can be divested of structures of power to just think about intersections of identity um, has almost opened up uh, this you know, conversation around marginalization where the men of the alt-right, the proud boys can you know, be me too, me too, me too, right? Or where a white man could don red face and call himself Native American. And so I fear, right? This, there's two, I have two perspectives on this. One, I think it's horrific, right? That she's not being taught and those who are also invested in social and political change are not being thought. On the other hand, I think there's something really powerful about being a kind of study for the undercommons, right? Again, outside of a panopticon of the white gaze, uh, where your, your message cannot be appropriate and co-opted by a the people who are waging a civil war 2.0, who want to pick up her theory and use it to think about their own feigned hysterical oppression. So the, the hand we're dealt is, is not a good one, right? They don't wanna teach her um, we're being overrun by uh, white supremacists, again, always <laughs> consistently without, um, without pause. But can we, like I said, repurpose the sunken place? Can we create underground uh, ecologies of living, right? Where we create our own interpretation and pass that message on of what Bell wanted us to think about and how she wanted us to live. So, so that's my my thought around that. The, the other thing that, that that I would say is intersectional feminism is is probably the most radical politics. So it's not surprising to me. I'm talking about within the U.S. and especially if it's anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, anti-heterosex, and blah. I think that it is the most radical. And so it's not surprising to me that Kimberly Crenshaw, Bell Hooks, uh, Angela Davis, you know, intersectional feminists who theorize and also I would say were activists. So African-American Policy Forum that Kimberly Crenshaw founded, they, they, they're at the forefront of fighting against Civil War II. Uh, you know, I think, if, I think if Kim were only doing critical race theory and also not intersectional feminism, uh, she would not be as hated. So, uh, so that's what that that's what I would say. And so, I mean, one of the things that I say to my students, and Rache will know this, this. So, when people think feminism is white, that is just laughable. It is laughable. <laughs> women of color, particularly Black women, are the ones who have created the most cogent, radical, <laughs> political theorizing and activism going back to the 19th century. And and but we were convinced, or tried to be convinced that it was some, somebody else, somebody else. And of course, Bell Hooks was one of the ones that helped us see that. And whenever I remember her, which I think is very, very important, walking around in stores, Connecticut, with not enough money to have a hotel room and, and promoting, your own, promoting your own book, it was that important for her to come to NWSA, where Audre Lorde spoke, and to keep, uh, doing that message. I, I want to add one thing, if I may. Speaking of intersectionality, I, I do think that thinking with Bell moves us away from the kinds of identity formation intersectionality that has been misunderstood, right? To take it back to structures of oppression, because Bell didn't just speak of intersectionality. She named those structures of power, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, cis heteropatriarchy, Right, she named it in such a way where it could not be depoliticized, and I think that might be seen as the threat right now. What do you think, Ellen? Answer your own question. <laughs> oh. oh, answer my own question. Um, I think that I think it's really, um, and I've been reflecting on it a lot. It. it um, we're in a, it's a strange situation we're in. So, you know, uh, the reason Bell's uh, work has been, I think, so centrally targeted is it's for a number of reasons. One, 
Her work is widely uh, taught in women's studies. She's a prolific writer. Her, 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 uh, her writing is clear, is fierce, is powerful. It, and it's been useful in women's studies classes be, in part because of what you said, Beverly, about um, this, uh, her work being about uh, a radical feminism. And so it has inspired a lot of students. Students talk about it. And so I think the, um, and, and also that in our women's studies classes are in many respects across the country still far too segregated in terms of that if there are more women taking these classes than men taking these classes. But the, but the white men who are coming after uh, Bell and Angela and, and Kim see the power in what Bell was writing about because it has convinced so many young people. And so those who would like to win Civil War 2.0, they are saying the one thing we have to do is stop our students, our children, from learning from that particular person how to think differently about a world where uh, that has become incredibly more diverse. And, and, that, and to them, diversity means they will lose the power that they have as white supremacists and white ideologues. Okay, so... If you want to stop that, one thing you need to do is stop teaching bell hooks. Stop teaching Kim Crenshaw. Call anything that's anti-Black, um, critical race theory, even if it's not. And some of them have admitted this, that, you know, yeah, we know that critical race theory is not taught uh, in elementary schools and high schools and sometimes in colleges and but largely in graduate school. They said, but we're going to call everything that so we can take it down. So even if you teach a, a, a chapbook about the story of Harriet Tubman in first grade, we're going to call that critical race theory. And that's what they're doing. And that's a, it's a plan. It's deliberate. And they understand what they're doing because they now recognize the power that uh, works like Bell's have had and, have, and the ways in which they've moved more people to think uh, critically about the status quo. They don't want that, so this is how you stop it. What I, what I feel sad about, I feel deeply troubled about, and Beverly and I have been talking about this all the last few weeks, what are we going to do about this? Because uh, we need to get out in front of this narrative that's going, that is being weaponized against us, using the work of some of the most visionary people in our lives, and Bell was among those people. And so uh, I think for us to sit and say, you know, um, well, they, they don't understand critical race theory or they don't know what Bell Hooks was talking about in teaching to transgress. Uh, we should just, you know, we should just explain it better to them. No, we should not keep trying to explain it better to them. We got to shut this down, uh, present a different narrative back to what some of the things that were said about uh, Lonnie yesterday be clear, be practical, be pragmatic, and turn this around. And that, I think, is the work. And every, literally every day when you see yet another attack on, uh, on Bell's work is a moment we have to, we, we can't get paralyzed. And I feel the paralysis coming. I feel that, uh, how many people signed the letter last week? 650 something uh, scholars and, and, and other uh, folks signed a letter against uh, the, what had happened with the, um, um, the AP, the Advanced Placement uh, course on African-American studies. Who knows about that? Who's doing anything about that? So writing letters is not gonna save us living differently, acting differently, doing what Bell talked about we needed to do, doing what Lonnie said we need to do is where we need to be right now. And so that's that's why I raised the question because I think I think it's a really critical moment. And let me say, I mean, one, one of the things that, that you really underscored, and I didn't talk about this, the, the impact that Bell Hooks had on young males, young males, white and black and brown, and 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 it's because in in Shadi, you know, she wanted she she wanted to have an impact on 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 men and boys, and uh, and she did. I mean, when she would come to Spelman to give talks, there were, there would be almost as many uh, Morehouse guys in the audience, 
and she, you know, they wouldn't always say what we would like for them to say, but she had a huge impact, huge impact. I, I want to add, if I may, towards the end of her life, and we would talk, you know, to Bella about what she wanted to do. And she said, I just want to write children's books, more children's books. Right. Um, and I think that she saw right that the that we needed to educate right new generations and what was great about bell is not just that she could spit theory and she could but that she could do it in a really accessible way and that she could do it even for children's books right um and so what she was especially concerned with was writing for for black boys um and for uh for their experiences and to for their humanity, for lack of a better word, world, right? And we see this in the gratuitous way that all Black people are killed um, by police and by the state, in which Black men following, you know, Jim Crow associations are hyper aggressive, right? And she wanted to tap into the sensitivity and uh, and uh, really uh, help support that in, in young Black boys. one more question or comment. I would like to know, I, I would like to know again, what are your favorite books from Bell and why? What book personally impacted each of you and why? Because there's like, what, 40, 40,000 of them? <laughs> but definitely 30, yes. I don't actually have a favorite. And you, <laughs> uh, I, can, I thought I knew. Uh, uh, um, you know, I have to, I, I, I'm attached to that first book, Ain't I a Woman, because of the history. And I just see her. Uh, but I like teaching to transgress. Mm -hmm. And what's the one that was geared to, to, to men? What's the title of that one? We Real Cool. Mm -hmm. I like that one too. Uh, and I like her children's books happy to be nappy mm -hmm. uh so so i so I, I i would have a hard time but i would i would say those oh and i like which people don't talk about i like bone black i like her memoir mm -hmm. okay i was also going to say bone black especially because it accounts for her experiences in appalachia i i i i want to share a story which is that bell did not want to be in the women's studies the women's studies program at the time at Berea. It was, she describes this in an interview. Um, and she says that she didn't want to be associated with the white woman who ran it. She thought it was problematic. So her appointment was in Appalachian studies, but she never ever felt that she was uh, seen as an Appalachian, right? And, and so I do think that Bone Black tells that story uh, beautifully. The other text I really like is uh, Black Looks, right? Because it engages popular culture. And for a long time, Eating the Other has kind of been um, a staple for me uh, to co-think uh, with Fanon about sexuality. Uh, Fanon says, between the, these white breasts that my hands fondle, white civilization and worldliness become mine. Um, and so what do we make with not just um, people of color who seek out white sexuality and touch, but what's the purchase? for white people who fetishize us, right? For whom we are um, a type, uh, a kink and not a person. Um, and so she's been really instrumental in helping me co-think sexuality and race through that, through that uh, work. What's your favorite book? Um, it, it's between um, Bone Black and, and, and um, Counterculture where she has um, more, more a deeper look at, at Madonna. Yeah, and some some of the class issues, uh, but teaching to transgress uh, changed my career. Yeah, it is, it is how I became a a digital pedagogy person. I I used those methods specifically and applied them to digital environments. So that was the one that probably impacted me most professionally. <laughs> so I have situationally favorite Bell books. Sort of, it sort of depends in this moment to sort of speak back to what Evelyn said, it would be from margin to center. Mm -hmm. Because as we're talking about these writers and theorists being marginalized from this AP curriculum, it, it really, if you take 
Bill's theorizing there um, asks us to think about what's the power on the outside? What's, what's how is that um, being pushed out a source of strength that can actually help to move that center, move that core? Um, so for that, it would be that book, but she, yeah, it just depends on the, what you need, the work you need her to do for you at any given moment, really. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shadi. It's good to see you. See, you look gorgeous. <laughs> you do. I'm taking a lesson from your playbook. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you, Beverly. It's always such a pleasure to be in conversation with you, to share time and space and Thank you to Sylvia and to, to everyone at Brown. Uh, again, I wish I could be with you in person. I'm sorry I can't. I look forward to, to really diving into the recording when it's available. Thank you. Uh, can Thanks. you stay for the next session? Shana, I'm going to try to. Can... Yeah, I'm going to. Is there a uh, recording? Come back. Yes, yeah, she can okay. come back. All right. See you later. So we have lunch that's outside um, right now in the hall for everyone. So hopefully you'll join us. And then we'll be back after that for the session after that. So thank you.
Yeah. That's going to be four. Four people. Okay. I'll move that chair right now.
Jake, where is the monitor on stage? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to this afternoon session. Our focus today is on bell hooks. We have had a wonderful day and a half um, celebrating the lives and legacies of Lonnie Grenier and Bell Hooks. But today is Bell's Day, and I'm really excited to introduce our panel um, this um, afternoon. Um, our moderator for this afternoon is Dr. Nolowe Rooks, and an interdisciplinary scholar. Nolowe is the chair and a faculty member in Africana Studies here at Brown University, and the founding director of the Segronomics Lab um, at the school. Her work explores how race and gender um, um, both impact and are impacted by popular culture, um, social history, and political life in the United States. She works on the cultural and racial implications of beauty, fashion, adornment, race, capitalism, and education, and the urban politics of food, cannabis production. The author of four books and numerous articles, essays, and op-eds, Rooks has received research funding from the Ford Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the Woodrow Wilson School, among others. She lectures frequently um, at colleges and universities across the country and is a regular contributor um, to popular outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and Time Magazine, and NPR, and look for her to contribute to some other things, but I digress, I won't go there. <laughs> Rook's current book is in which she um, coined the term segronomics, is cutting school, um, is cutting school, privatization, segregation, and the end of public education, which won an award for nonfiction from the Hurston Wright Foundation. Her current research, for which she has received a Kaplan Fellowship and um, a fellowship from the Atkinson School, Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future, will explore relationships between capitalism, land, urban food, politics, cannabis um, legalization, and the in the United States. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nolowe Rooks to the stage. Joining Dr. Rooks is um, Dr. Roche Richardson. Dr. Richardson is professor of African-American literature and Africana studies and research center at Cornell University. Her interviews have been highlighted in news media such as the NBC, um, the Today Show, Nightly News, CNN, Al Jazeera's News Hour, and the New York Times. Her op-eds have appeared in the New York Times, Public Books, and the Huff Post. She has produced over 40 essays and have been published in journals as American Literature, Mississippi Quarterly, the Forum for Modern Language Studies, um, Black Renaissance, Renaissance Noir, Trans um, Atlantic, just to name a few. Um, she was highlighted um, by choice book among the outstanding academic titles of 2008, her book, Black Masculinity in the U.S. South, From Uncle Tom to Gangster. Love that title. 
<laughs> and her recent book, Emancipation's Daughters, Reimagining Black Femininity and the Natural National Body, was released by Duke University Press in 2020. Since 2018, she has served as the editor of the new Southern Studies book series in the University of Georgia Press and was co-editor um, from its conception in um, 05. Um, um, Dr. Richardson is also a visual artist. Please welcome Dr. Richardson to the stage. Thank you. Joining us virtually is Rebecca Walter. Rebecca is a best-selling create, um, creator, consultant, and cultural catalyst who has contributed to the global conversation about race, gender, sexuality, um, power for over two decades. Her books include Black, White, and Jewish, Autobiography of a, a Shifting Self, Body Love, Choosing Motherhood After a Lifetime of Ambivalence, Black Cool, um, 1,000 Streams of Blackness to Interactive Journals, What's Your Story? A Guide to Everyday Evolution and Women Talk, Money, Breaking the Taboo. She has written, developed, and produced film and television products, um, projects with um, Warner Brothers, NBC Universal, Amazon, HBO, and Paramount. Spoken at over 400 universities and corporate campuses, including Harvard, the Whitney Museum, the TEDx, um, the Lond, and services as a and serves as a DEI consultant for several uh, Fortune 500 companies. When Rebecca was 21, she co-founded the Third Wave Fund, which makes grants to women and transgender youth working for social justice. She has won many awards, including the Woman Who Could Be President Award from the League of Women Voters, and was named by Time Magazine as one of the most influential leaders of her generation. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us virtually is Rebecca Walters. Hello there. And last but certainly not least <laughs> is Dr. Demarcus Hill. Um, who is a poet and creative scholar. She is the author of Breath um, Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood, A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, The Incarceration of African-American Women from Here at Tubman to Sandra Blonde, The Fluid Boundaries of Suffrage and Jim Crow, Stalking Claims in the American Heartland, and other works. Her digital works include Shut Up in My Bones, a 21st century poem. Similar to her creative process, Hill's scholarly research is interdisciplinary, and she is a professor of English and creative writing in Africana, African American studies at the University of Kentucky. And um, Dr. Hill spent the fall semester here as a fellow in the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at Brown University. Please welcome Dr. Hill to the stage. Hey everybody, how you doing? You all right? Matthew, can you take a picture of us for me please? And send it to me, thank you. <laughs> so our panel is to really kind of situate and talk about Gloria Watkins' bell hooks uh, from a personal as well as a intellectual perspective. Some of us have had a uh, real relationships with her. Um, some of us teach much of her work. Um, we understand her light, her genius, and her complexities in a multitude of ways. Um, and we are here to just sort of begin to explore some, just to open things up. Um, I'm going to ask, and we'll start with Rebecca, then Damaris, and then Rache for this. Just talk, talk to us about who Gloria was to you when you came to know her and mostly what you want the audience both here and online to know about her, what you're most interested in people taking away what you think about her work. So we'll start with Rebecca. Oh, oh, no sound, no sound. Jake, is there a <clears throat> Hi everyone, how's that? Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I'm recovering from COVID, so I, I brought some notes <clears throat> because, you know, this thing is a little bit hard on the mind. Um, but <clears throat> I think I can can just jump right in um, and say, you know, I studied with Bell at Yale when I was an undergraduate. She was a visiting professor 
And we were all as women of color, as people of color, as students who were starved for, for food, for intellectual food, for psycho, spiritual, emotional solace, for um, inspiration, for enlightenment. We were starving at that time. This was the early 90s. And I, I came into Belle's orbit as, as a young seeker. And she was an exemplary um, teacher and guide in almost every way. So when I think about Belle and when I think about what I, what I would like people to know about her, her lived, the, the lived experience of Belle um, is that she lived as herself completely. She lived um, with passion, with depth, with glamour, with rigor, with critical insight. Um, she was funny. She was always laughing. She was always making jokes. Um, she had us, you know, just, she, she had a, a buoyancy of spirit, you know, that, that kept us going. Um, she believed in the power of black women. She believed in the power of the sacred community. Um, she also believed in stirring the pot of that community because she felt that, you know, it, it needed um, a constant revisioning and energizing. And that was part of her gift was to just be completely fearless in asking questions and pushing us further. Um, I remember her as being incredibly disciplined, almost monastic. She brought rigor in a way that I had never experienced anyone bringing rigor. Um, I remember the, a little small thing I thought of as I was waiting to come on. She also wrote in the tiniest script, and, and anyone who, who's seen her writing knows this, and it was as if, <clears throat> after knowing her incredible, prodigious, prolific output, it was almost as if she was concerned that there would never be enough space, never enough pages, you know, to, to fill the multitude of her, of her voice and her thoughts and her ideas. Um, so that's, that's the beginning um, of what I would say that I would like people to, to kind of feel about Belle. Thank you. Um, I first met Val probably in the pages of her work. Um, and it was privileged enough later to apply some of the theories of uh, the teachings of Sarah Fred into my head and I was in the And then, fortunately enough, when I started working in the country, we were able to see the building. Likewise, you are talking about about her funny, joyful. Her home um, for me was the most welcoming and sacred space in the country. Um, and she was able to teach me how to strategize, capitalize, and turn rage into a weapon of power that was useful in specific ways. Like Damaris, I first encountered Belvis in her writing in the Corner at age 18 through the Spelman College freshman reading list, which included uh, multiple selections, um, among them, Ain't Our Woman. And then within the next two years, I read her more casually on my own essay collections like Talking Back and Yearning. And I saw her speak for the first time at Woodruff Library in Atlanta, where that day she was putting the heat on John Singleton's film, Boys in the Hood, mm -hmm. a film about which a lot of us were feeling very sentimental at the time. I thought that I was a pretty good cultural critic, but apparently not good enough. And yeah. She, um, in that moment, I think, encapsulated that um, courageous spirit that said what needed to be said. And, and so I really appreciated um, her candor. Um, and it urged us to think about the film in new ways. And so that was interesting. And then I encountered her soon after that, more formally, once I became a minor in women's studies, working with uh, Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal 
and as a senior at Spelman, and we uh, read her book, Black Looks. I feel that actually taking courses with Dr. Guy Sheftal and Dr. Wade Gells was one of the main things that prepared me uh, for graduate school and actually reading Bell Hooks because she introduced a lot of the critical concepts that I eventually encountered in my graduate career and so really helped with that transition. In graduate school, I tended to relate to her because I was inspired by her pedagogy and also um, works such as Art on My Mind. It's that book actually more than anything else that encouraged me to begin to collect Southern folk art. You know, she helped me to understand that art was available, that art was accessible, even for say, uh, beginning assistant professors. And so her example made all the difference for me and my own collection would have been inconceivable and impossible without the example of Bell Hooks. For years, I tended to think of her and read her in a more private way and savor the personal impact that she made on me in terms of my path as a scholar, um, initially in the University of California, eventually at Cornell. At Cornell was where I began to realize that um, it would be valuable and important to teach her full body of, of, of works more comprehensively in much the same way that I approached the work of Nobel laureate uh, Toni Morrison and a happy birthday to Toni Morrison today. But um, I introduced the Bell Hooks Books course in 2013 and it got a wonderful reception, including a lot of support from my former colleague, uh, Naliwe Rooks. Thank you again so much for that. And more recently, I taught it this past fall as a tribute to her. And what was exciting about that moment was that there were 25 undergraduates who enthousi enthusiastically embraced it. Some of them had you know, been introduced to bell hooks before. Some of them didn't know anything about her and were just curious to learn. And so one thing that I knew was that I had to somehow get them in a, in a room with Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal. And I was so thankful that she visited our class. It was just more than I could have ever, ever hoped for and a deep inspiration. And the students were very excited to um, hear what um, Beverly had to say. So um, in terms of her impact, what I think I, I want people to know that has been special to me about Bell Hooks is that she's definitely, um, from where I stand, a premier and model Black Southern woman intellectual and just a, 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 an esteemed and superior and model intellectual in general. And then I also appreciate her profound cultural impact. So I wasn't actually supposed to talk, but anybody who knows me knows that that's a whatever kind of proposition. So over, oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, Rebecca, sure, sure. Yeah, I wanted to just add because of the eloquence of, of the two of you who have just spoken, I want to add a little bit about what she was able to give me as a writer. Um, I think that she, <clears throat> if she hadn't written Wounds of Passion, I would never have written my first memoir. Um, black, white, and Jewish. I, I think that that what she was able to give to those of us who did not want to follow an academic path, who did not want to get our PhDs, who did not want to be um, what we experienced as bound by the academic um, expectation and, and paradigm. Um, I think she, she really told us your genius, your intelligence, your creativity is just as valuable and even if you have to, um, you know, give, give yourself the, 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 um, the PhD, you know, give yourself the letters, give yourself the affirmation, you can do that because this, this kind of, of reverence and respect is, is your birthright to have, and you don't need to get it from an institution. And that was a great gift, you know, to those of us who, who found ourselves more on the artist uh, journey, on the seeker's journey, and, and couldn't really do the work that, that the three of you on stage are doing, which is to really you know, be able to soldier on in, in, a, in an environment that often I experience as extremely hostile to Black women and to our creativity and voice. And, and without her model, I think it would have been extremely difficult for me to do the work that I do. So I just wanted to, I was over lunch just talking about the first time I actually met um, 
bell hooks. And I can't remember if I had engaged her work at that point, um, but I, I was at Spelman and Beverly was having some kind of event in the Women's Center. Um, and this group called Sweet Honey and the Rock was going to be playing in Atlanta. And, and much to, I'm like, I'm embarrassed now, but I had never heard of Sweet Honey and the Rock at the time, right? I mean, so, so people were like, Sweet Honey and the Rock is coming and Bernice Johnson Reagan is our Spellman sister. And, you know, like we, we're, we're all, everybody was really excited. And I'm kind of like, and who's that? I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but at the, at the, uh, Kind of gathering that we were having I, I you know was running around kind of going I, who's, who is, I don't know who this is but I don't have any money in any case I'd like to go so I just started randomly asking people in the room for money <laughs> now I will tell you uh Beverly was a little horrified at this low mm -hmm. level but she was or or stunned she was like you are literally like running around asking these random people for money like what are you thinking but Gloria Bell Hooks uh pulled out ten dollars and handed it to me and it got the flow starting so other people <laughs> you know got over Beverly's like you know like, what is going on with her and started going in their pocket and that's the first time that I got to see it so there's a generosity of spirit Absolutely. that I appreciated um uh, and I will always, honestly, just remember, see Sweet Honey in the Rock because Bell Hooks mm -hmm. got us started. Of course, I had a different kind of respect for her mm -hmm. going forward as I engaged more of her work. Um, in talking, oh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Rebecca said. I, I love that um, one of the gifts that, that Bell Hooks gave us is that I think prior to her entrance in the academy in terms of intellectualism, there was definitely this double helix and this pairing of elitism uh, co-opting intellectualism. And she made it a point to disrupt that. And in disrupting that, she made a lot of space for creative scholars, artists, and for those of us that were pursuing intellectual lives and thinking but did not want to be bound by the paradigms that already existed and knew that those paradigms did not account for our lives and the ways that we wanted to appropriate knowledge. And I think if that that happened with bell hooks is how yeah. I, I interpret that. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that I will um, also add is that I think a quality that I found to be intensely captivating about her among so many was her willingness to discuss herself, her life, and to draw on her life experiences. Within feminism, we hear that um, mantra, the personal is political. And I think that she embodied that ethos um, quite compellingly, always, and consistently. And so her work was very um, inspiring and I think provocative, always and revealing at the level that she discussed the personal and owned um, her relationship to her history and past and used it, I think, to enrich and impact so many lives. And then eventually um, seeing her memoir, reading her memoir, um, Bone Black was also a wonderful experience. And it, it pulled together and synthesized so many parts of her story that we had encountered in other places. So when we think of a kind of um, ultimate uh, serial um, writer or autobiographer, um, the esteemed Dr. Maya Angelou comes to mind. But at a different level, I, I really value Bell Hooks for having consistently and in a serialized form shared her autobiography. Mm -hmm. Picking up on that, um, also over lunch, we were talking a little bit about how geography matters in Bell Hooks' is, is world, uh, how she talks about her family, she locates herself in the South. Um, very often she returned to the South. I'm wondering if we could just very briefly kind of think about her um, in terms of geography, in terms of the South, in terms of how place um, really mattered and shaped who she was, the genius, the core of that genius was nurtured in black communities and black households um, in, in Appalachia, mm -hmm. in the South that sometimes we don't always claim as a black South. 
Exactly. So I, let's do Demerit and then uh, Rache and then Rebecca. I, I live in Kentucky now, and Kentucky is is kind of wedged in between the Midwest, the Upper Delta, what I'm calling the Upper Delta, and then the Plains region. Um, and it wasn't until I visited Hopkinsville that I got to better understand Bone Black and 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 Bell Hooks, Gloria Watkins, in a much more um, tangible way. Not growing up in that central location, but understanding the cultural and political complexity of that space produces resilient Black girl genius. It's not appropriate, but we cannot deny the genius of Brown alumni, um, Gail Jones. We can't deny the genius of ZZ Packer. We can't deny the, the genius of Crystal Wilkinson and the highly intellectual genius of Bell Hooks, all coming from that, that cauldron and space and, and that, that um, specific type of conflation of power, racism, agricultural culture, agricultural culture, and, and, and the specific history that black women have in that place in terms of slavery, of it being a state where much of the breeding was happening and the production of, of slaves to be um, shipped out to other spaces along the Mississippi and in the Midwest. I don't know if that made any sense, but. What y'all think, since you want more, you need explanation, you good? Yeah. Good, that was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, Kentucky produces those really brilliant women that are writers and that are inclined to always reshape the boundaries that are put in front of them and in a generous way that allow us to envision better futures. And as we were talking about earlier, this type of prophetic envisioning, this prophetic imagination of the future. Mm. They do that. I think that my critical work on what it means to be a Black Southerner and the value of uh, drawing on geography, analytically speaking, and uh, thinking through aspects of U.S. culture, uh, goes back to my years as, at Spelman as an undergraduate um, in that although everyone, almost everyone, because Spelman, you know, always had exchange students, but um, all of us were Black, all of us were women. And so it meant that other different constituting categories had room to come front and center. And it's within that context that I noticed uh, the emphasis on the urban in shaping so many aspects of uh, social life and concomitantly a devaluation of aspects of Black Southern identity. And so, those were dynamics that I noticed in a more casual sense as an undergraduate, but by my graduate years began to think of the implications of those dynamics from a much more um, critical and philosophical uh, foundation. And reading works like Bell Hooks's Wounds of Passion, describing uh, what it meant to migrate from the South and Kentucky, Westford to attend school at Stanford and encountering a lot of stereotypes and ideologies about uh, Southern identity was a very instructive thing for me. And it affirmed some of what I had observed myself about the, the problematic of the, um, the, the, the problem with such uh, cultural politics. And so I value the ways in which she foregrounded her background as um, a woman who 
um, has origins in the U.S. South and then drew on it for critical thinking. And it's very much what I've tried to do in so many aspects of my own intellectual work and art. Thank you. Rebecca? Yeah, I haven't spoken very much on this subject, but <clears throat> it strikes me that um, I did a lot of my undergraduate work on um, what I was calling then shack aesthetic, which is really a study of the built environment of black people in the South and linking that the ways in which we encode our environments and our spaces um, with different ideas from West African cosmology. And I was obviously working with Sylvia Arden Boone, um, Robert Ferris Thompson when I was at Yale. And, and those were, were some of my mentors in that space. And when I think about the ways in which the South informed Bell's practice and, and my experience of her, I think about her built environment. I think about her home place. And I think about the way in which it resonated with me as a daughter of the South as well, the daughter of a mother of deeply of the South who, who always created spaces um, in our home that were, I would say in many ways, anti-capitalist, um, that were of the earth, that were pro-beauty, that were all about creating a space for the ancestral spirits to dwell and a space for the living and the present to commune. Um, they were spaces full of art, of, of a transcendent spiritual um, energy. And, and Bell was very much a part of that geomancy. When I experienced her, her environment, there was, a, there was a homecoming for me. There was a recognition of the empty chair that is left for the, the stranger or the spirit. There is a sense of the images of the ancestral past so that we are connecting with the past, the present, and the future. There is a use of color that is dynamic. There are no straight lines. There's the zig, there's the zag, there's the openness for anything to happen. Um, and there's not a lot of um, not a lot of stuff from Walmart, not a lot of plastic, not a lot, you know, there's wood, there, there, there are real materials. Um, and there's a relationship to the earth around, all around, right? The sky, the light, the ground, the, you know. And, and to me, that's very much out of the Southern tradition. Um, and so that is, is where I, I really find words to express that relationship. And I think so much of, of her work and being um, emerged from from the space that she built and that was shaped by all of these different forces and, and stories and voices that she grew up with. So I'm wondering if we can uh, talk a little bit about the space that she opened up for black women or black scholars um, to really claim the title intellectual unproblematically. Uh -huh. um, it's a it's a fraught term, you know, like some some in our communities push back against the idea of women claiming that title of intellectual of black people claiming the title of intellectual and, and at her core for me, she was. Um, but if y'all could just kind of talk a little bit about that. The, the complications of that space when you want to step into it um, and say, this is who I am and how she helps us think about it. We'll start with Rache and go backwards. So Rache, Damaris, Rebecca. Well, about um, Bell Hooks, I've always loved and admired her self-awareness about what she likes, and her passionate approaches to doing her work and being deeply committed to those processes. Um, I, I really have admired that she discussed her sense of process and it, I think, was the kind of thing that helped me to understand that not all aspects of one's process had to be perfect. Um, embodied perfectly, but that it was a practice and an ongoing um, challenge in some ways, but that 
we were charged to, you know, um, persist. And so that's one thing that I think has stuck with me. Spoman was an institution um, by the time I was there, very premised on notions of black women's empowerment. And um, by the time that I was a senior and at age, age 21, I was an emerging artist and also bound for graduate school at Duke. And it was at that juncture that I began to conceptualize my goals as being um, to become a writer, artist, and activist, whatever that meant. And I wasn't in, entirely um, sure, you know, about what that entailed, but that was the bar that was set from the very beginning and going out into the world. And like many, um, I think that there, there's been the sense um, that we, we've witnessed of what it means to be an intellectual being very um, male-centered and even identified primarily with masculinity. Um, as someone myself who uh, attended all Black Catholic schools from first grade and who was a student leader by my junior and senior years as student council vice president, then president at the historic St. Jude Educational Institute in Montgomery, Alabama, best historically known as the final camping space for Selma to Montgomery marchers in 1965, I didn't really feel that sense of otherness or um, it, how can I say it? I mean, I, I made better grades than a lot of the boys. And also I was a prominent student leader. And so I, 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 I was always very confident about my intellectual abilities. And so I think that once I did go to college and um, once I had exposure to just so many phenomenal black women at Spelman en masse, the bar was high. And it was an experience that authorized me to indeed pursue my goals and dreams. And reading scholars like Bell Hooks definitely added to that. And she was um, charting a very unique path as a professional. And that was also intensely public. And, and so all of um, what I witnessed, I think, during that formative period really inspired me tremendously. I think my, I, I thank you for that story. Um, you made me think about, I think my formative process was somewhat delayed by, by parenting, but in between the time of me earning my undergraduate degree at Morgan State University and the master's degree, and then returning for my PhD, I was looking for, for people like bell hooks to teach me how not to live my life in precious categories, but to live as a whole person. Mm. And that did not exist for me before I started really looking to bell hooks about how to have this intellectual life that wasn't policed or regulated exclusively by theories that dictated the canon or they came before me? And how do I become an intellectual demerits, an administrative demerits, and a writer demerits that also happens to be a mother? And Belle did her fair share of othering mothering, right? And so yeah. looking towards um, her life as an example, living and writing transparently and with everything with everything, being unashamed, bringing your grief to the page, bringing your victories to the page, thinking about your traumas and griefs as springboards into a new intellectual dimension. So I, I think the word intellectual is almost too small to describe the way that she shifted that paradigm from being a linear one to being a dynamic one. Mm. Yeah. Preach. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, honey. That was fantastic. I don't know if I can <laughs> add anything good to that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. You know, I, I always say, you know, Bell taught me how to think. 
Um, I also came from a, a very um, intellectual uh, family. And, and when I went off to college, I, I pretty much thought I knew a lot of things. I, I was not afraid to think of myself as an intellectual. I was a thinker. I was, I was, you know, I was standing up in every class, you know, calling teachers to the mat, calling my classmates to the mat, you know, and, and I was, I was fully, you know, comfortable in that space. And I'm very grateful that I was raised to be that way. Um, but Bell took it to another level for me. Um, Bell said, you know, okay, you know, you can think, but what's the thought underneath the thought? You know, what are you really thinking? <laughs> what are you really saying? What are you really centering? Who are you really serving? Who is the master? What is going on? You know, even with your sense of centering yourself, how is it that you are able to be centered in your community at any moment? What does that mean? Um, and so she she really pushed me to understand that that being a, a true intellectual, a true thinker was a, a many layered, a many, a many, uh, you know, a, a, a multitude of experiences. And because I was able to be with her in so many different spaces and to talk about so many different things, I came to understand that you never left your intellect outside. You know, your intellect, your mind, the way in which you were assessing situations, it was in the bedroom. It was at the kitchen table. It was walking down the street. It was watching every single thing you watched and thought about. It was, it permeated, you know, it, it was, it was not just designed for the intellectual conversation, right? It was, it was about bringing a level of acuity and self-awareness and determination and activism and commitment to transforming thought and the world around you to every moment of your life. And that was a different level of being an intellectual. <laughs> you know, that was like, okay. And, and it's exactly as, as you just said, it's, it's the, in, the word intellectual seems far too small. You know, this was, this was a, a new level that, that crashed through ideas of intellect and was about the, the bleeding, the sharing, the oozing, the emanation of a genius that is our birthright. And she gave us that permission. She showed us that birthright. And, and that, uh, you know, th there are no words to describe for me the importance of, of that gift. I would love if we could come up with a word, not right now. <laughs> I know we could. Is too small to contain bell hooks. What what could we craft? I'm not asking all this right now, but you can think about it for your final thoughts. What could we craft that does justice to the complexity um, of what she brought to us? So I I I think of bell hooks as having been irreverently black in a way, um, and expressively complicated. Um, and I'm wondering if y'all can talk a little bit, both if, if you want to talk about how it shows up in your own, the consequences of irreverence and complication, um, self in our, how, how that shows up for us individually or how you saw it impacting how Gloria Bell Hooks moved through the world. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's do Damaris, Rebecca, Rache. Mixing stuff up. <laughs> Mixing stuff up, yes. Um, so when we think about the history of this space we call America, mm -hmm. the whole purpose of the inter, you know, the intersections of identity that would make you black woman and associate you with class were, were exploitation on multiple levels for your intellect, for your body, for your children, so on and so forth. And so when I think about Bell unapologetically bringing this culture into the higher education industrial complex, let's call something like that, right? Um, and just her presence, even before she demonstrated her genius plus, 
or demonstrated her intellectual capabilities, just her presence in that space was enough to destabilize and begin to rattle and tremor the higher educational space because black women are supposed to be accessible and commodified in a way that she was not accessible and commodified. And I think it brought more to that unapologetically black had a lot to do with her being unapologetically free and a black woman in a kind of intellectual blues woman, existentialist, unbound kind of way that she was okay with her, her mouth representing Sapphire, right? She was okay with being impolite. She was okay with being viewed as, as rude or disruptive and, and accepted the consequences of her liberated choice. Yeah. And, um, and I think that she talked about a few of them, you know, some of them might been might have been her sanity at certain times, <laughs> you know, how she felt personally about her sanity. But whenever you dislocate yourself from the social contract that has been constructed for, for you in this place called America or any other place, but particularly here, you will be disciplined until you find yourself back in that role. And if you choose never to be there, you'll continue to be disciplined. Rebecca. Yes. I think you should just, are you writing all of this? <laughs> because I love your voice <laughs> um, and everything that you're saying. I, I, would, I would add to that, you know, when I was at school with Belle, we all prayed that she would be offered a position. And, and, you know, at that time, I think we were talking about maybe three, four, maybe five at the most black people with tenure at Yale. Um, and yet to us, it was like, well, of course, you know, she, <laughs> who else could possibly um, be as worthy? And, you know, at a certain point, it became clear that that was not going to happen. And I think we all, or I did, you know, in, in the conversations that we had and also my assessment of the university, it became clear that she was not going to be offered that path because she was, as we've all said, unapologetic. She was herself. She was fierce. She was challenging. She was not going to be silenced. She was not going to be shamed. She was not fit into this, 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 this space of the, of the sort of docile, giving, accommodating, all the different things that we that we know Black women are supposed to do. She was not going to be grateful that, that she had been giving this. She was going to understand that she deserved the position and more. And that in itself was the, the thing that kept her from, from getting it. Um, and I think <clears throat> when I think about the ways in which we're disciplined, I think about the fact, you know, Bell did not get a MacArthur Genius Grant. You know, Bell did not get a multi-million dollar book deal. Bell did not get an endowed professorship at an Ivy League institution. And these are the ways in which, um, you know, we could say she paid the price for her, her liberation. She paid the price. And that's the price so many of us pay when we do, you know, to use, you know, an old, an old, way of speaking about when we speak truth to power, when we stand as who we are, when we resist the, the limitations that are put on us that tell us to be quiet, that tell us to be smaller, that tell us not to think critically, not to think in ways that dismantle the system. Mm -hmm. um, when we refuse to do that, we are not rewarded. And so we, we have to find other spaces of reward and other spaces of self-reclamation and honoring. And I, I think that for me, um, the way in which she drew her power at the end of all of that, when, when it became very clear that that's what was happening, um, what you turn to and what she turned to and what I turned to is your readers, your, the people are the ones that count. You, know? you start to realize that you, you have to, as always, put your faith in, in the medicine you're bringing and in the love that you get 
from those who are taking your medicine and who are going to love you and, and honor you. And as we are doing right now, speak your name after your death and, and, for, and forever, you know, and that's where you find the strength and the power. And that's where the rewards lie in the community, you know, and I think that Belle really, whether she understood that at the beginning or whether she came to understand it like so many of us come to understand it, um, she managed to, to embrace it and transform it into a real model of, of being. Thank you so much. In a personal sense, my beloved grandmother, Emma Lou Jenkins Richardson, has been a source of empowerment and inspiration in my life over the years, um, along with my mother and, 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 and other um, family members. But um, I remember certain things. Uh, as a seven-year-old, she bought me Easter cards to pass out one year, like Valentine cards. Mm -hmm. So I filled them out and took them to school but no one else was passing out Easter cards. So I didn't either and took them back home. And she was kind of upset about that. She's like, I paid three dollars and something for those cards. She <laughs> didn't bring them back home. Or she would a lot of times, you know, give me a brooch or something like that to pin on my uniform. I could be very self-conscious in moments like that. As an adult in University of California, her send-off every morning to me was usually hold up your head and strut. That was the way that I went off into the world in Sacramento every day to catch my bus for many years. And that and I love you were always what she said in her phone calls from Alabama to me every morning. In, a, in an academic context, I valued uh, Bell Hooks's model in terms of what it means to talk back. Mm -hmm. and to own one's voice, to do what another one of my professors says, um, Gloria Wade Gales, claim your space. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that mean? And even within the institution, you know, to have that boldness to indeed claim one's space and operate under the premise that I do indeed belong here. Because so often we are treated as guests. I remember even when I first arrived at Duke, some of the graduate students would say things like, oh, it's, it's good you're here, you know, but there's that implication that somehow the person of color is the guest within the institution. And so what does it mean to have a sense of our own belonging in these institutions and to be very acutely aware of what we bring that without our contributions, these institutions are diminished. And then I think that there was that quality about Bell Hooks that um, we saw where she, again, took the tough positions and in, in so many instances, the ability to do so took courage, what it means to speak up. During the time when um, Obama was on the campaign trail, I remember uh, in my former English department, um, or my, my former department at um, University of California, Davis, another scholar and I would have these whispered conversations, usually in the doorway her, of her office or mine, about the progress that Obama was making. And in retrospect, I have to ask myself, why on earth are we whispering? You know, this is a liberal department purportedly, and yet and still, there was a sense that certain conversations had to be kept on the quiet. I think an age of social media has helped me to become far more comfortable in my own skin in the academy and to increasingly claim and own my voice. And I could never in a million years go back to that walking on eggshells feeling that I had, you know, I think in a context like that, um, keeping the stiff upper lip or, you know, just really not necessarily being too noisy about certain issues. I think that it's okay actually to make noise. And Bell Hooks was one of those people, I think, who helped pave the way, you know, to more freedom and more of a sense of voice for so many scholars and intellectuals all around. 
Um, she definitely is that type of person who helped me to understand and recognize that I could simultaneously claim my interests in writing and art, that those interests were not necessarily mutually exclusive or should not be kept in separate spheres. And so that's something that I've um, valued from her, you know, from Shirley Chisholm, that idea of what it means to be truly unbought and mm -hmm. unbossed is an ethos that I think that bell hooks um, quintessentially embody that we should never be defined or confined by institutions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did you, uh, uh, did you want to say something? No, go ahead. I was, I was think, listening to um, Dr. Richardson, I was just thinking about James Baldwin's quote that um, for for white for white people education is indoctrination for black people education is assimilation and just thinking about all the ways that Bell resisted that mm -hmm. in in every aspect of her academic career. Mm. I think uh, just kind of bouncing off of what you just said. Um, Damaris, I guess you should call y'all Professor Hill, <laughs> Professor Richardson. Yeah. Um, we're, we're in a particular moment right, right now. The country's going through some things. Like the country's always going through some things, but those things are um, falling disproportionately on queer folks, Black folks um, right now in terms of making clear what and who is accepted what kinds of writers. Um, Bell Hooks was just kicked out of the AP curriculum that's supposed to be African-American studies, right? And there are a lot of us that are like, there, there just simply is no African-American studies mm -hmm. without Bell Hooks. There's simply no analysis of women's studies without Bell Hooks. There's no analysis of, of media, mm -hmm. um, of Black love that doesn't include Bell Hooks mm -hmm. for a lot of us. But in this moment, we're watching a pretty frontal assault that I feel like she's prepared us for in some ways, Absolutely. right? I mean, those of us who, who knew her, who read her, who lift her up, um, she, she, we should be soldiers in some kind of army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or she gave us some insights and some moments and some thinking to prepare us for what we're facing. What do y'all think? And I didn't tell you I was gonna ask you this, but... Mm -hmm. um, what do y'all think? What is what is it she would urge us to do in this moment around these issues? Um, what did she leave us that we're willing to embrace? Do it, you would do Rebecca Damaris and then Rache? Well, I think she left us everything that we've talked about, which is you know, <clears throat> you know, inhabit yourself and your space and your life in your fullness. And do not allow anyone to to amputate and, and do not amputate any parts of yourself and and muster all you have and and all you have been given to to speak up and and to make sure that your your voice is heard and that you feel comfortable in any room that you find yourself and that you never allow anyone to take your your dignity your your sense of belonging your sense of um, of righteousness um and and a, and a, a fierceness don't don't ever don't ever stand back from that and and i would also say you know and i find myself talking to students about this a lot i do not think that bell um would be supportive of a lot of language in the classroom necessarily <clears throat> about not feeling safe in difficult conversations and that is not to say that that all of these academic environments that we know are often unsafe psycho spiritually in other way in other ways. Um, it's not to say that they are safe spaces, but it is to say that 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 the women who came before us and the women who are surrounding all of us, we we are not doing our work so that young women um, and men and non-binary folks can can be in classrooms and feel that they cannot speak in their true voices and have meaningful, you know, confrontational, if necessary, conversations with their classmates and with their professors. And I, I, I think about this stance of, of, of sort of 
a, a sort of an extreme vulnerability that is being embraced as a as a kind of narrative of empowerment. And I, I I'm not I'm not sure where Bell would stand on that. I mean, you know, I I remember being in African lit class, and you know, Cyprian Aquenzi was there talking about you know, how I shouldn't be asking my questions. If I were in his country, I would be killed. Was I a lesbian? How dare I question the fact that all of the black women in his books died? And my professor, Michael Cook, did not say anything in my defense, you know, but I persisted, you know, it was, it did not feel safe at all. And yet I was um, determined to, to bring the voices of all of those black women who had been murdered in his books and in his world and in his life and in his, in our lives to the table and 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 I was not going to be silenced and my my sense of retribution that my grades would suffer that my fellow students would think this I, that did not stop me and it did not stop me when I stood up in a, in a lecture hall full of 300 people in front of the most preeminent art historian teaching the history of art and said this class should be called the history of white western male art period and the entire the entire room was quiet. And he told me to sit down and be quiet. And I left that room. She did not teach us not to do that. And that is what I want young people to be doing in this moment, um, to, to move away from a stance of um, a, a sort of um, sense of, 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 oh, this is, this is, this is, this is too much. This is what it is. And it's going to always be this way. It has been this way. It is going to continue to be this way. And, and, and we need to continue to rise to the moment. Um, and, and not, and not encourage a kind of silencing and policing, but to engage with our full intellect and our full capacity as emotional, empathetic, brilliant people in furthering the discourse through our beings and our minds. So I, I, I think that she, she would have a lot to say about, about this moment, um, especially in, in, the, in the classroom and on these campuses. Uh -huh. Thank you. Clarence. It's an unpopular conversation. I, I keep oh, having it. People necessary. keep telling me, I'm that's gonna brilliant. cut this out because you could be canceled. I mean, I have a lot to say, <laughs> but right. I, she would, she would, you know, we cannot afraid to be afraid of being canceled at this point. You know, there's too much to lose. You know? I totally agree with everything Rebecca said, but I was thinking something differently initially when you asked the conversation. I think we are so fractured and in operating in individual silos mm -hmm. that under this immense attack, we have not yet become organized even to defend ourselves, more or less get back on the offensive. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to figure out what 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 that may look like in this in this type of cipher and conversation with the work that has come before, right? Because this is not a new um, obstacle. These obstacles have always existed in American life. And I think that's a lot of what I was trying to do in, in A Bound Woman is think about the Black women strategists and intellectuals that came before and how they resisted times like this, that in, when I was writing the book, I thought we were at our worst, mm. right? So I'm thinking a lot about Bell's work, but I'm also questioning where are the allies? Where are the warriors? What is important to my allies? What are our goals? And how are we moving forward in this grip around democracy's neck? How, how are we doing it? And where are the strategists? And where mm -hmm. are the strategists? Mm -hmm. Yes, one thing. Um, that has actually troubled me for quite a while is that, I mean, I, I feel that Bell Hooks was actually one of the very first people who were attacked. Mm -hmm. um, I was, was very disturbed to hear about the commencement speech that she gave a few years ago in Texas 
where because she used the phrase white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, there was mm -hmm. pushback in the audience and a, a very hostile response to that. And it's moments like that that I think in certain ways um, helped establish foundations for a lot of what we're seeing now mm -hmm. with the increasing um, empowerment of these very reactionary cultural sectors, very invested in um, suppressing any, any and all forms of free speech. And the contradictions, the hypocrisy, I think, really bother, bother me because um, if we took it, like, you know, with the Second Amendment, for instance, um, the Second Amendment is held to be sacred and uh, a given right for Americans, except when it comes to Black people. Mm -hmm. Or the First Amendment, you know, free speech is, is a very sacred thing and sacralized thing in this culture except when it comes to black people and other people of color. And so it's okay to target their works for censorship. So yes, I think that it is important as Bell Hooks um, urges us to speak truth to power and to dare to tell the truth and to, um, to really call out these um, gross distortions of um, black intellectual history uh, of, you know, the issues with women. I mean, we, we cannot thrive or survive as a culture with all of this um, insistent myth making. Mm -hmm. And then there's the um, Nobel laureate Toni Morrison, again, um, was another person I, I, I was thinking a lot about in relation to these issues and, and um, feeling um, strongly about when um, she similarly was um, censored uh, a few months ago by reactionaries. And what really disturbs me about that is that her perspective is one that we really need to even begin to honestly address issues of race, mm -hmm. you know, where she famously describes it in that interview with Charlie Rose as a neurosis that, you know, people insistently misunderstand. And so the very people who we we need to be thinking with are the ones who, in some cases, are just so deliberately marginalized within the conversation. And yes, there should be outrage. Yes, there should be mobilization. I think where are we if we're in a culture where people feel okay, actually, to um, approach, say, the first black um, um, first? I mean, the first black vice president in this nation, Kamala Harris, to mm -hmm. literally refer to her as a Jezebel or mm -hmm. to dare to use phrases like Joe and the Ho, mm -hmm. and we don't have collective outrage. I do take seriously mm -hmm. um, First Lady Michelle Obama's um, phrasing that, you know, when they go low, we go high. But sometimes I wonder if that's even enough. You know, when I look at you know, those casual childhood playground phrases like, well, sticks and stones um, may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. I look at that um, Black Miss USA, Chelsea, you know, and, and the way in which she was so vehemently just uh, discussed and that hurt her. It really hurt her mm -hmm. and possibly ultimately killed her. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot that we can do and should do mm -hmm. to um, concertedly address this very repressive and toxic culture that threatens to set us back, you know, a half century or more. Minimal, yeah. right. I'm, so I'm, I'm we, gonna go add ahead. one more thing that about Kamala Harris. I, for me, the most offensive was putting her face on a milk carton and declaring it missing. Mm. And what we saw about Meghan Markle over in England, mm. the, the strip, it's too, it's, yeah. too it's, black going back. it's back to, to uh, the National um, National Association of Colored Women who mm. had to stand up to a racist journalist who called Black women, um, what do you call us? Like the, the, the prostitutes and liars. Um, and and an 
entire organizational structure rose up to call that a loss. Mm -hmm. um, defending our name, Black women created or an organization with um, tendrils, mm -hmm. right? That, that was called into being because of the public disrespect. Mm -hmm. But if we're using our, our bell hooks lens, right, to actually analyze the problem, she would say that all of this aggression is proof that we have the solutions and the power, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that was the type of subversive way that she kind of, not subversive, but the, the kind of um, reading the dark matter in the room mm -hmm. is what Bell's intellectual fortitude was like. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that she would say. Yes. And I think she would say in response to what you, what you raised about where are our allies and how do we organize, one of the things she would she would refer to, which is something that I feel very is very true, and it's not a it's it's not rocket science, but but you know when we think about how we get our words out, you know how we, when we how do we connect with our people, our allies, how do we find each other? When we think about as as writers and artists, and we think about the gatekeepers and how you know the big five publishing houses are not and never were really enthusiastic about publishing. Bell until much later, I think about the small presses, you know, I think about the ways in which the internet, while it is so problematic in so many ways, does create a forum and a way for us to connect. Um, I think about in my own work, Black Cool, which I think is one of the most important books for me and, and definitely deeply influenced by Bell and, and one of her pieces is in it. And right now I'm doing a second volume. You know, I took that book out to everybody. Nobody wanted it other than, you know, a very small press. And, you know, that those are, you know, you find your people where they are. And, and, and I'm so grateful for those small presses that are out there supporting us continually. I think she would, she would speak to that, you know, to, to really appreciate um, the intimate, the small and the power of that and to understand that that grows. And I think she would respond to, 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 to Michelle Obama and the idea that we should, you know, when they go low, we go high. I mean, I think that's obviously you know, Bell would, would find the spiritual elevation to that and the, and the evolutionary idea to that and the dignity. And she would also say, that's respectability politics 101. And who does that serve, you know? And how has it served us? It has served us in terms of our humanity, yes. And there is something that is lost. And we need to really be aware of everything that we're saying when we say that. Because disrespectability politics are real too. Exactly. So I think we can open it up to the audience at this point, because um, obviously we can just sit here and talk. I believe it's obvious um, mm -hmm. for the next 20 minutes. But hopefully there's been something mentioned, something raised. Got a, you got a question um, in mind. I don't know if we have a microphone. You might just have to jump up and project your voice which Bell was very good at. <laughs> yeah, diaphragm talking. If not right now, just do final thoughts wrapping up. And while y'all get yourselves together, raise your hand, somebody will give you a microphone and we'll just be wrapping up while, while that's happening. Um, we'll start with Rache, Damaris, Rebecca. Any final thoughts? Yes, um, just a few. I, I very much um, view Bell Hooks as having been a premier public intellectual, even though I use that term very provisionally. I think a lot of what has been said already underscores that she um, blazed a trail and yet and still didn't necessarily reap all of the benefits that came thereafter from um, certain precedents that she established and so much of what she did was unprecedented and truly admirable. I think that she also um, popularized public scholarship approaches in ways that in retrospect have been far more democratized in the academy and that we can learn from and appreciate. One thing that I've always admired about her is that in so many ways, she invented the genre in which she writes. One of the things that I um, would say like years ago in terms of trying to come to voice about Bell Hooks's um, 
profound intellectual impact and the importance of her writing is that if I encountered a person who had been away um, Rip Van Winkle style, and if I could give that person just one person to read, who would that be? And Bell Hooks was always the person I would, you know, um, suggest uh, in my own little uh, scenario, because I, I felt that if that person immersed uh, themselves in the reading of her books, then they could really catch up because her, her work covered just so much ground. Um, and so her body of books um, covers so many important uh, topics that I think it's really an indispensable uh, toolbox for thinking with, including about topics such as po popular culture. Um, I think that, you know, she's definitely been um, a, a, a path-breaking uh, intellectual in raising um, questions and um, observations about Black girlhood, as well as Black art, uh, Black popular culture. So across the board, uh, she's been very, very innovative, consistently innovative. When I was an, uh, an assistant professor in California, just starting out after a busy week, one thing that I would enjoy doing uh, would be to go to my computer on Friday evenings and I would go to that site for front list books, um, which was briefly um, a, a service that one could order from in North Carolina. And I would love the descriptions. I ordered from them actually maybe once or twice, but I would just read on that website. And another form of reading that I would do was to go to the Shambhala Sun site and read essays by Bell Hooks. And these were very different kinds of essays, even from any that seemed to be available in other places. It was where I heard her voice I heard a very different uh, bell hooks voice in some ways. And I, I, I was just so enriched by reading those essays and I savored them and in some cases recommended them to other people. Um, bell hooks is timeless. Uh, she's unforgettable and I salute her legacy and am so thankful that I have had her influence on my own life and work. Are you? Can we pass to Rebecca? We can pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of in a moment. Okay, I'm coming. Okay, I'm kind of, uh, Shake missed us. Yeah, I'm kind of in a moment. But Shake got us in our feelings, as they say. Yeah. All right, Rebecca. Okay, well, I'm again. I feel that so much has been said, um, but I, I love that you just raised Shambhala um, because, as a, I'm also a Buddhist practitioner, as was Bell. Um, I'm a 30 year. Uh, practitioner of, of Dharma, and and it was it was that was a place where we met in, in in that space of understanding how Buddhist practice could inform our mental health and well being and support us as we were being the warriors that we were um, that she was definitely embodying and that I was aspiring to embody, and and I think that's a space that doesn't get talked about very much, and it's and it's a space that I hope many people who seek her and find her can 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 enter into because it's a it's a powerful tool um technology as people are are saying that can be used to to clear one's mind and settle one in a sense of peace irrespective of what's going on around you so i'm really i for, i i i'm sorry that i forgot to bring in buddhism because it was such a big part of her life um and I, you know, I think we we all are so grateful for her and love her and and everything that has already been said. I think I I, I want to just give us a, a small example of how I learned from her. Um, you know, I I think for the first twenty years and even still today, of giving talks on college campuses, every, all the different talks, I started every single talk with an example from Bell, and it was this. I, I would get up and say, um, you know, this, I'm standing behind the patriarchal pulpit, as, as Bell would say when I would go up to the podium. This is the phallic shield, and it was designed to, to, to protect the interlocutor between God, the person up high, and the people coming to get the wisdom, 
right? So that every, all of you, I would say to people in the audience, and I'm saying now, all of you are supposed to be thought of as, as lesser than, than me, the person at the podium, and especially, and I'm lesser than the, the big man over there. And, and then I would say, and you know what Belle taught me? She taught me to come out from behind the patriarchal pulpit and to stand with you and to honor that we all have the knowledge. And that I am here to learn from you as much as you are here to learn from me. And that there does not need to be an interlocutor because we are all embodying the spirit. And, and to me that in a nutshell <laughs> was, was her gift. It was the decolonization of our intellect, the decolonization of our true knowledge and our ability to commune together um, and to find the value in one another, as opposed to looking for an interlocutor to bestow upon us mm -hmm. the right to be who we are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I totally agree with that. I'm in between two minds still, but um, the first the first thing I'm thinking about now is um, the legacies of bell hooks um, exceeding, you know, how we view her in this professional space um, in terms of higher education. What does it mean to be like, you know, this other type of secular, spiritual? wisdom and guide how how do her her plain text that we have right now act as a type of scroll and a guide for living better futures but then also th that that might be the the high me the low me is like what would bell do if she was in a celebrity death match with a senior senator from kentucky <laughs> like you know like um you know, like just just playing with those boundaries and thinking about Bell returning to Kentucky in this peculiar time and space and challenging everything that the political policies might be so loud about. And then, you know, kind of having a conversation with myself and on the page that that, you know, that old saying that a that a prophet can never be recognized in their own town. I mean, you you have divine wisdom walking all around you, yet you don't ask advice, right? And so those are, I'm thinking about legacy beyond the intellectual, right? What does the dynamic um, life of Bell look like in, in legacy form? I, I'm not sure what it is yet. That's what you got. Okay, that's what you got. Still no questions. Y'all still silent. Okay. Well, we can. I think we're about done. You don't have to ask a question. We don't have any questions. What? No. Uh, uh, we have shamed people. Did questions are the best part, y'all. I know. <laughs> so there's one there and one here. So we'll start. So considering the influence, oh, 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 we need juice. There we go. Considering the influence she's had on your lives, mm -hmm. and how do you feel? How do you feel you uh, pay that forward to the students in your classroom to the next generation? Um, mm -hmm. Because not only intellectually does she seem to have affected your lives, but also on a very personal level. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that? you do that for the next generation? I hope to. I mean, um, Mache talked about attending Spelman. I attended an HBCU. And one thing that I take from that experience that I think Bell challenged me to enhance, not only on the page, but in conversation, is one of the benefits of an HBCU environment is that you're educated in love. And as a black girl or a black person, there might not be any other space where you're educated in love, which is a completely different educational experience than what I experience outside of that space. But when, when Belle challenged you, spoke with you, gave you her little trickster vibe, 
question you about one thing, but evaluated you on 17 things. It was always with, with that ethos of, of love, I think, at the core and the need for intimacy to know you, not in just who you say you are, but also in your behaviors, in, 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 in your psychological and mental spaces, in your spiritual life. So challenging me and enhancing the ability to kind of be a teacher that teaches in a space of love and responds to my students out of love, not, a, not out of obligation, not because it's my job, but in a space of understanding that this is a reciprocal relationship that we are both growing in this habitat together. Mm. Anyone else? Beautiful. I could I could add to that. I feel I feel very similarly. You know, this idea of teaching with love, and um, and also teaching with the intention of helping my students and my readers to 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 rewrite their stories in ways that are that are that are powerful for them to go back into the dark the dark space and find the light that is there and and to help them understand that they can do that that they are wired to hold on to stories that are keeping them in spaces that are not healthy and that they have the power to rewrite themselves into being in a different way. And that's definitely something that, that was Belle's work and what she, what she gave. And I feel very much called to do that work and to hold people it, with love and to teach with love and to teach with, with spirit, with, with a sense of um, this is a practice. You know, Belle talked a lot about going into her writing as going into a sacred space, a holy space. And, and that to me is something that I always want to invite my students and, 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 the, and the people that I touch and move with to remember that this is a space that, that is healing if you can enter in. And for me, the, the goals are very similar. I um, am ever, um, working to support my students, to nurture them and to encourage them to think outside the box. Um, Bell Hooks was my introduction to principles of critical pedagogy from my graduate years. And so I've always taken those values with me over the now almost 25 years of my academic career. I feel that actually teaching Bell Hooks' body of works also raised the bar exponentially in very interesting ways in terms of um, creating a classroom space and community. And I'm mm -hmm. still processing that experience in so many ways, but something very different happened in the classroom last fall, unlike anything I had ever seen before, in part because we were Again, you know, reading bell hooks as had been the case years earlier in 2013, um, where there was one, uh, like for art on my mind, for example, one of the students has said that he wanted to uh, maybe have an art exercise as part of the presentation. And so I was like, oh, okay, sure. And then I um, was the last person to come in that day. And by the time that I arrived, um, he and his co-presenter had passed out pieces of paper. They had the water and watercolors all arranged around the classroom so that as we um, began, they wanted us to do an exercise where everyone um, made a piece of art. And, and then after that, um, the students were given a choice to continue to work and many of them did. And they described how different it was to be able to do something like that in the classroom and that they had not made art in some cases since childhood. And it was just something that drew um, on different parts of them that you know they felt had not been adequately nurtured in the culture of Cornell. And next thing we were in a conversation where a lot of them were beginning to express frustrations about not having access to spaces to create art unless they were formally enrolled in courses, what it meant not to have access to studios. And some of them described even having more access 
to these places in the community instead of on campus. And they describe how important it was to have this access even um, to um, nurture their mental health. And so we had a conversation that ultimately had to do with thinking about strategies for bringing about change at the university and making more of these resources available. So the projects were very different from any that I've seen in um, classes before. And I think that that had to do with the phenomenal impact and example of Bell Hooks. Mm -hmm. So with that, we're at time and I want to thank y'all for bringing your whole selves to yeah. this. Thank you. thank you. Happy to be here. Rebecca, I haven't seen you in forever. It's good to see you. It's so good to see I mean, you. It's been like decades, right? Girl, decades. <laughs> so many decades. But I love you then. I love you now. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Till next time. Yes. All right. Bye-bye. I'm so happy to share this time with y'all. Mm -hmm. Thank y'all. That was extraordinary. You were extraordinary. You really were. I think you can free something. Yeah. Like, wait. Hmm?
So good afternoon. We are here for um, our last conversation, celebrating Bell Hook's life and legacy. I'm so excited to be a part of this esteemed group, our colleagues, Beverly Gashefta, Evelyn Hammonds, Nolaway Rooks. What you all should know, it was the brain power of everybody here who said, let's come together and let's do something. And this is really exciting. Bell Hooks once said, I will not have my life narrowed down. I will not bow down to somebody else's whim or to someone else's ignorance. Mm -hmm. And I think about that quote from Bell, and I think about the times in which we live in as the last panel um, discussed. And I'm wondering how, and, and sometimes the anger that rises up out of the current um, uh, space we find ourselves in. How can we use Belle um, and her legacy, her teachings um, to help us in this moment? Um, I think of Belle as being free and not because she has transitioned to a different space, but because of who she is and how she lived her life on her own terms. Um, and I wonder what she would tell us to do and how can you use your scholarship to help us um, get to a place that will um, address some of the things that we face now? We're looking at you, Beverly. <laughs> we all looking at you. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a couple of things that I hope will not be perceived to, to, to be coming from an ageist place. <laughs> I, I, I do think that we have some generational challenges mm -hmm. uh, which Bell talked a lot about. Um, and what I mean by that is celebrityism, individualism, materialism, uh, being seen are uh, th those those uh, uh, things have really seduced mm -hmm. young people in the U.S. Um, in 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 ways that are very very disturbing. And one of the things, and we were sort of talking about this. One of the things that that um, uh, Rebecca reminded 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 me of. Um, Bell Hooks never got any awards. <laughs> um, Sonia Sanchez now at the end of her life is getting some. Yes. Okay, she never got any award. She never got a MacArthur. Uh, she never had an endowed chair. And if, and if I will tell you, which I won't, what her salary was at Berea College, you would be stunned. So the, the financial uh, stability that Bell Hooks got was not from her salaries in the university. It was from her very careful um, purchasing of real estate mm. that she then resold. So, so she wouldn't she wouldn't even have the financial stability uh, that she ended up having. She didn't get big speaking engagement uh, fees. Uh, she wasn't this big public intellectual. And also think about it, her books were published by, by um, small presses. Mm -hmm. 
Be, uh, uh, but before that, before, uh, table, before being a, no, not South kitchen end, table, South South, end, South end press. South end. So she 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 didn't she didn't have all of the things that, unfortunately, I think this younger generation uh, ha, uh, attaches a lot of importance to. She didn't care that she was not on television, or being interviewed, you know, in certain kinds of ways. And she and I would talk about that, what what, what it means. Uh, in our classes to have our students move away from capitalism mm -hmm. and individualism and the desire for I'm, I'm, desire for BMWs and mm -hmm. the desire for certain kind of material wealth. And so, so that's one of the things that I think that we need to have a much more cross-generational talk about what is really important in life. And what is not important is all of the things that this culture convinces you will make you happy. And uh, so I think that, that, that we, we've, got those, we've got those challenges and I'm happy to take them on in class. But I think, I think you make some good points, Beverly, but I also feel that it's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a deeper, I think it's a deeper problem because I think it speaks more to the sense of of um, really having uh, an occupying and oppositional position to uh, what is presented to us as uh, right now. And I, I'm gonna follow generational arc a little bit that uh, things have progressed so far or you know, that, um, that we can, that we can uh, relax mm -hmm. and rest. And I think of, of uh, Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois and those folks, they were like, yeah, we, we can't ever turn our ways, our eyes away from what is really happening to our people. And the minute we do, then we're in trouble. And I think the cult of celebrity, um, the uh, focus on sort of certain individuals, uh, uh, African-Americans in particular, who've achieved a great deal in this culture. People have MacArthur's, people have TV shows, people have production studios, they have all of this. But what part of what they've earned have they then turned to be in service of all of our people who are still disenfranchised? And that commitment to turning it that way uh, is what I am worried about with certain in, in certain respects about the younger generation. And then when you ask what they wanna do, it's almost as if uh, they can't really articulate that, uh, many of our students, and, and that <laughs> deeply troubles me because I'm sort of, you know, look at what Ida B. Wells did when, you know, what were we talking about a hundred years ago? Over a hundred years ago? And, um, you know, put their lives on the line. They were, she was not a poor person at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, look at Du Bois, he was of Harvard. Uh, I, I should say it this way. He would say he was in Harvard, but not of Harvard. And he turned the skills that he learned at Harvard into creating a new kind of social science in service of black people. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna see, when, when am I gonna see the things being turned around to be in service of, of people who need who need still need help and continue to challenge the deeply, deeply embedded structures of racism in this country. And I, I want to see that. I want to hear people being committed to that. And being committed to that means being sort of in you be a celebrity, but you know, what are you going to do with that? Mm -hmm. And we should we should be asking people, what are you going to do with it? And I think that's the question um, that this um generation faces, but then I also think we have a responsibility. And if we don't speak up right now in the face of this extraordinary challenge, then we will not have been in service of the people in the ways that we want to be as educators. Yeah, I, I was just having a conversation with a young person at the break when y'all started without me, I was actually talking to the young people up there. Um, 
who was saying that part of what had come out of the conversation was making them um, really feel like there was a was a responsibility to do something, you know, hearing about this, but also recognizing that they had not encountered bell hooks in a in a classroom. They're uh, ethnic studies, you know, majoring in ethics, and and saying, you know, it seems like I should have come across this work. Um, in ethnic studies. And what what I'm thinking is two things about that. One, um, we're on the, we, we are, many of us believe, I'm one of them, that we are facing an onslaught and a threat that we have not seen in an age. This is not business as usual. This is not, we're always in crisis. This is not, things are always precarious. Something else is happening. And woe be unto any of you that think that higher education is the vanguard of some revolutionary onslaught. We are not here. <laughs> the, the, the corporation that is Brown University, the corporations um, that, are, that are many of the well-endowed schools um, have a business ethos mm -hmm. as much as anything else. Um, and the moment the, that moment of bell hooks at coming out of Stanford, going to, to Yale, going to, she actually is a model for how in this business, you can in fact start to um, have young people synthesize mm -hmm. what it means to be anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchal, to, um, to see the structures that are attempting to undo the life of you, you, you and yours, um, and to begin to think your way out of it. That's not the norm. You know, I wish it were. It was norm for me, you know, at Spelman with some people I had, but th that comes mm -hmm. to some particular kinds of teachers who, who believe that part of what we're trying to do is give young people the tools to see these structures as, as some of needing to be dismantled um, and understanding the personal costs that come along with that. You may not get the Guggenheim. You may not get the McKinsey Fellowship. You may not be at Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. um, but other choices might have kept us from this moment that could be an apocalypse. Right. And so it's a, it's a, these spaces aren't designed for liberation, <laughs> but, but it is the case that there's sometimes some of us who inhabit them, um, who believe that that's what we've been charged to do. The thing is, you, if that's what you're interested in, you have to find it. But institutionally, like I'm concerned, like I'm, I'm trying to figure out who I need to go talk with to in ethnic studies that you are like, literally, I can do that. Like I can find out what is it that is happening in your classrooms that no one, a student is saying they have never encountered this, this, this revolutionary thinker that is Bell Hooks. The second part of that, and then I'm going to stop. Really, no, that's okay. Is um, at lunch, we were also just talking about how many Black women scholars and thinkers uh, end up relatively unknown. Right. And Gloria, uh, Beverly was sharing that this was a fear that uh -huh. that Bell Hooks had, that no one would know her. Um, I, I recently learned Audre Lorde had a similar kind mm -hmm. of, you know, that that she she just wasn't, because she wasn't getting the amplification. She wasn't getting, that she just wouldn't be known. And I, I just wrote a book on Mary McLeod Bethune and it's just a whole thing there. I, like I can go, like, just don't get me started on her, but she's what started me on that road. When you see the arc of the contribution with similar to, to Gloria, similar to Lonnie Guineer, uh -huh. um, and the absence, the intellectual absence of their presence. Um, and that's as scary to me yes. Um, yes. as as what's what's happening in the nation. Because who do you have to be if you can write thirty books, if you can inspire the way that we've heard, if you if you can think rings around <laughs> most of Western intellectual thought, and you're worried you won't be remembered, and it's a real fear. There's a reason for you to worry. Um, you're not just paranoid.
So what strikes me about um, the panelists today and you all um, and assessing Bell Hooks and, and Lonnie is your shared experiences at different times at historically black college or university. So no, I think one. Well, I experience. know. Yes. Yeah, this Spellman, we could sing the Spellman hymn up here. Right? <laughs> this is all Spellman right here, yeah. let me say. But, but I think about how do we, um, how can institutions like Brown, non HBCUs, um, outside of Africana studies, outside of ethnic studies, outside of women's studies, make bell hooks accessible to everyone? So I also, Demaris, introduced to Bell very late in my life and my academic career. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in part because of, of perhaps what I chose to focus on academically. And it's because um, of not having that kind of access and not being aware, um, having read her works, that I, I, I feel cheated and I feel like there was, um, that she's a great gift and that she has, um, she was um, someone who was um, free and her work was very instructive. But I feel like um, to so many, and I'm trying to follow my thoughts here. I feel like for so many people um, that Belle um, is, is, is not understood, um, and, and, and why they may have heard of her, they may not know where to begin. Um, and so my questions to you all, um, it, somebody said it earlier and I believe Rebecca suggested it, but where would you, what's the first book that you would, for someone, for someone who's never, um, not myself, but for someone who has never um, read Bell or for someone who is um, new to Bell, let me, let me, I gotta say this. Okay. Most HBCUs do, are not teaching bell hooks. Exactly. Okay. So it's exactly. not just ethnic studies at Brown. Okay. Okay. Number two, mm -hmm. bell hooks is not in our ADW syllabus That's at Spelman. Okay. So you could wow. actually go through Spelman and not necessarily encounter bell hooks. So I need to say that, mm -hmm. that radical black feminists writers are not necessarily, ain't you clapping over there, are not necessarily being read okay. at HBCUs, which is why we asked Mellon for some funds mm -hmm. to do this work, gender and sexuality studies at HBCU. So I just really need to say that. Yes. I, I think one of the things I, I, I want to say to speak to this question in a, in a slightly different way, I just did a, a consultancy at a small liberal arts college uh, in the Northeast, and that's all I'm going to say about where it was. Um, and, you know, they've, uh, faculty have had discussions. They want to institute uh, an anti-racist curriculum, uh, similarly to some of the efforts going on at various schools around the country, including, uh, including Harvard. And what I always find in those conversations are people who say, well, you know, maybe we should just hire one person who knows uh, all of this literature that that uh, that you know, Evelyn, and, like the African American literature, uh, uh, including Black women's literature, Black feminist issues, uh, African American history writ large, all of this, and then then we can just maybe we just move them around in different departments, and they can that person can uh -huh. can can do introduce our students to all of this. And I'm like, you know what? What does it mean to be an educated person in this country anymore? Do you think most people who consider themselves educated in this country say, well, you know, I, I couldn't possibly say anything to have anything to do with Shakespeare. I'm not a Shakespearean scholar, but you know who Shakespeare is? You've seen a, you've read a play mm -hmm. or you've heard about a play or you've mm -hmm. seen a movie. You, most people who call themselves educated would be embarrassed if they did not know who Shakespeare is. I want people to be embarrassed not knowing who Bell Hooks is. I mm -hmm. want them to be a best friend. Mm -hmm. If it means, if what it means to be an educated person in this country is that you have come in contact with some of the best thinkers of a generation, that's everybody's responsibility. And you don't get to hire one person who runs around and tells everybody, mm -hmm. you know, what book they should have read, what book they shouldn't have read, all this kind of stuff. Because if you're committed to it, it would have already been there. 
for everybody to have to come to terms with. And I say that with some emotion mm -hmm. because I felt like I've been in the academy now 36 years. And I'm like, really? So you, you, you don't have to stretch. I am a historian of American science and medicine and public health and African-American studies and women and gender studies. I am an inter interdisciplinary scholar. What that means is I read constantly all across and I still read Shakespeare because yeah. that's what you do. That's part of the, the intellectual culture in liberal arts colleges is that you understand the great works. I may not like it, but I understand who he, who Shakespeare was and why he was important to people to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I, I do not understand, and I'm getting really, really tired after 36 years of trying to explain why you don't have the same commitment to understanding W.E.B. Du Bois and mm -hmm. all these other folks that we're talking about, and Ida B. Wells and everybody in this country, but not to mention just African-American scholars and intellectuals and artists and all of that but for people of color who made this country what it is why well, you don't know any native american writers you've not read any latino and latinx folks you've not read any asian american people how then you're not an educated person anymore yep. and you ought to be saying well here i am 70 years old and i'm not even really educated i guess i better get to work mm -hmm. i better i guess i better start thinking about it and that's my my, my sense is we have allowed ourselves a pass to what the real commitment, it seems to me that a liberal arts colleges are supposed to be about. Du Bois went and studied in Berlin. Mm -hmm. He understood the great German traditions of social science. He brings them back. He uses them in all kinds of things. And he was an amazingly interdisciplinary person too. I'm not comparing myself to Du Bois, but I think that, that there's, there's a kind of resistance that we have normalized that says that we can't, everybody's not responsible for this. And I think that's part of what comes through in Bell's work and Lonnie's work, that you, you, you can't not know these things. It's not okay anymore. And they both did incredible work to hold our attention front and center Lonnie on her work on voting rights and what it means that everybody should have a right to vote as a citizen in this country. And how do we do that? And just laser focused on it. As Bell was and say you when she, you know, would talk about, you know, structures of oppression, and I'm gonna stop here, that she that she wasn't just talking to people of color, she was talking to everybody. And the fact that when she gave that commencement address and people booed her, those people booed her because they know that she was talking about them. Mm -hmm. And they didn't like being talked about mm -hmm. to their faces at commencement. Can I say one little oh, thing? Yeah. I tell my students when I'm talking about bell hooks that she read before she got sick about 10 books a day across all kinds of categories. And one of the moments in my teaching career, which is now 53 years, a student came up to me after because you know we know this they don't particularly they did not grow up reading the way we did she said could you give me a reading list could you give me a reading list of books that I can read mm -hmm. and it was just from saying this person that it, it is a big intellectual still reads every day so I just wanted to say that I want to say for those of y'all who've seen I know it's been I've, I've been living in a world where Florida and the AP tests loom large it's also because I'm teaching a class about race and human education this semester but there's something that was circulating around about things that had been taken out of the African-American AP curriculum that just had a bunch of names with red strike throughs um, going through it. And, and Bell Hooks was on it, James Baldwin, Sylvia Winter, Kim, um, Crenshaw. Kim Crenshaw, Angela, Angela, Angela Davis. Davis, blah, blah, blah. Um, and one thing I wanna say for anyone who is decrying uh, what is happening in Florida with DeSantis and that AP and those writers, if you look in the mirror and you haven't read those writers, you should be quiet. You, you have access to those writers. You're grown, if your outrage is about what's being struck for other people and you have no knowledge of most, like maybe you've read one or two, um, 
the, this is a, a black radical revolutionary radical tradition that they took out not just black mm -hmm. thinkers yep. and so when you ask what where to start with bell hooks for me it's a it's a kind of a loaded question because it, it, it depends on for what she wrote so many right. things mm -hmm. different genres yes. um different periods of time different things that she was interacting with um right in through here i love marge in the center but that's i mean i think i said earlier that's just because the the mar as we are pushed farther and farther into the margins um of democratic thinking of American society, of economic viability, of mental health, of um, the, the what is happening to Black people um, in all these markers of health, educational, um, economic, cultural, social, uh, we're, we are losing ground. And so the margins are in fact becoming this space, a theoretical space in which we live in actual space in which more and more of us live. And there's a way, so she was writing about specifically white feminists, the feminist movement and what black people were doing and you know how uh, there's always this kind of claim that certain writers are marginalized. So in that book, she wants to problematize that, that idea of the margins mm -hmm. as lacking power mm -hmm. um, of a, as a, a whole separate kind of place and she wants to reclaim it as a place where organizing is happening, um, where thought bridging <laughs> is happening, where politics is taking place, and, and um, to decenter that center that is the status quo, right? In this moment, for me, that thinking is really important, right? Just for the, the, the sheer teaching to transgress is nobody if you're in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, and you give any thought to your pedagogy at all, or if you're in the classroom and trying to understand your professor's pedagogy <laughs> um, and pedagogical practices, or maybe make some sense out of what's working for you, what's not working for you, to get to, again, if you're interested in a radical praxis, because you don't read bell hooks for what do I, how do I design a syllabus? That's not, you know, that that's not where she's going <laughs> to take you. But if you want to talk about voice and writing and thinking and um, how to construct a class to, to um, heighten some of these issues that are useful, then that book I think is wonderful. And it just memoirs, someone else said, Bone Black. Mm. I, I find a beautiful thing. So she got 30 books. I understand that could be intimidating and people are not like, let's just read all the bell hooks. But most <laughs> a, few, a few of them are more than 200 and some pages though. So you really could, you're not talking about 500 page um, tomes, but um, to start, it and then the stuff that she did in her later life about the politics of love I, it is extraordinary. I mean, the stuff she's done on love is just extraordinary. We often, if you now, now, now I'm getting the weeds a little bit. So for those of us who teach African American studies, um, we often start with James Baldwin and talking about love. Yes. We often um, talk about MLK and his beloved community and talking about love as we're going through history and literature. Love, centering love is is not unusual for thinkers, right? Like trying to marshal. Um, but the way that Gloria theorizes, the way Bell Hooks theorizes um, love as practice and praxis, I think there's there's no better place to start for that. That's where I would start too, because just personally and professionally, uh, her writings about the radical power of love yeah. mm -hmm. is to me helpful at this particular moment or else I would be angry 100% of my day. Mm -hmm. And that is not how I want to spend my days. I like to spend my days thinking about what it means uh, when she says we're here to love. And it helps break that anger that I, you know, like that cloud I walk, that I walk under all the time, all over the place, and helps put me in a different frame for confronting, you know, all the issues that you were just talking about. So personally, it's a time of life for me where that is some of her most important writing for me and where I get to reflect on life differently. I just want to just pivot just a little bit um, and 
and, and thinking of Belle, but also thinking of each of you and your body support. And can you share a little bit of, 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 of whatever area of your work that you would like to, that you feel connects a great deal to Belle? Oh, wait, I can tell that I can go first with this because when I was in grad school and wrote my dissertation, so my, my, my dissertation, which became my first book, is a book about the politics of hair um, and for Black women. It's called Hair Raising Beauty Culture and Afro-American Women. And um, for two reasons, Bell Hooks was, was central. One uh, just had to do with her making... Um, it possible to think about the aesthetics, about Black aesthetics um, as a topic worthy of study in the academy, um, bodily aesthetics, hair, skin color, how we dress. Um, she noticed, like these are things that she noticed um, and that she theorized regularly. And before her, I didn't have a coherent body of thought that I could see myself engaging that was about something as intimate and yet is unknown. It's sort of hair, like black, black, there are no black women I talked to about hair that were kind of like, I never thought about any of those things. However, there are all kinds of people who are like, really? All of that's going on? There's like femininity. Gloria had written a book, an essay, and I don't remember I don't remember where it is, but there's this line where she said, our femininity is in our hair. Um, and that, like just being able to, to, and then she went on to talk about how that's ridiculous and you need to do other things, but the but just locating um, such a large construct as femininity um, in this, in hair, <laughs> um, gave me the, the permission to think and to dream similarly. Um, and then because I had to fight everybody to get that book to let for them to let me do it as a dissertation because the the white women and men who I had to propose my topic to were all like but that's not a real that's not well, scholarly I mean that's not we're not getting a dissertation we're not making you a doctor <laughs> based on you wanted to say some things about hair and black women um but she honestly it is it's her she she gave me a certain kind of intellectual and institutional permission to keep to keep pushing, to keep pressing, to keep figuring out what's the argument, what's the way. It was never a question of changing my topic, though I was told I needed to. It was a, it was a question of strategizing my way to get them to agree to it and not to be completely hostile because that's just the upward bat, uh, uh, that's just Sisyphean. You just don't want to fight that. Your whole committee is like, this sucks, this is stupid. You decide to write it everything you get back from them is going to be this sucks, this is stupid. So she gave me the, the, a way to convince them um, that this was not, uh, didn't suck and stupid. It was like, wow, it's original. No, we just don't know this. And perhaps starting with something that black women know, um, maybe a different starting point, but maybe we should start there. And it was it was literally her who are marshaled regularly in emails and arguments to get that done. Do you want me to go? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I think um, also from, from Margin to Center, and that is specifically because um, after my time in graduate school as a physicist and in my work, working as an engineer and going back to school to get my PhD in the history of science, believe me, the contributions of African-Americans uh, or any other people of color to the development of, of American science was as much of a non-starter as black women's hair. Yeah. It was <laughs> like, why would you want to write about these people who've never won a Nobel prize? These people have never had made serious contributions to anything important. We don't have a single paper that's, you know, the most important paper in, in any scientific field that was written by a Black person. I mean, why in what in what possible interest could there be in writing about the uh, African Americans, uh, men and women, and I wanted to write about Black women and science um, that, that couldn't possibly be of any value whatsoever. Um, and unlike Nullaway, in terms of my dissertation, I realized that I I could not fight that tie by myself. So they really pushed me to have to 
prove that I could be a real historian of science first. And then after I finished my dissertation and that first book, then I could go and do that other kind of stuff, which was going to be about race that they, by then they wouldn't care whatever I did. And, um, and that's pretty much what I did. But um, so I've been, I've been preoccupied with this notion of margin to center for mostly all of my work that I do on um, the history of, of African-Americans in American science. And, um, and so that work has continued to be pivotal for me, as well as I said, as I said yesterday, becoming gentlemen, because that is what Lonnie was talking about. And I was fortunate to have many conversations with her about what it would mean to not think about um, what African-Americans were doing in the scientific and technical enterprise. It was important to find those people who were doing stuff that had just been ignored, like many of you must know Hidden Figures. If you've not read the book, you've seen the movie. And, um, you know, finding that uh, there were Black folks who were doing things. <laughs> um, and then not just finding that they were doing and high-level scientific and technical work, um, <clears throat> but trying to understand the structures that erase their, their contributions. So I've been thinking about those for a long time. It was the most, those two, Becoming Gentleman and For Margin the Center, it just... That's how I think. That's how I think about the whole project of trying to understand um, the ways in which American science, medicine, public health has been um, organized to produce the marginalization of Black people. I, I think it would be hard for people to realize how difficult it was to be an out feminist if you were my age. And at the beginning, I mean, and I'm talking about in the black community. And I won't, I will not mention some of th those experiences. Well, I, you know, you got located as hating a black man, being divisive, being a lesbian, being um, unattractive, all of those things. Bell, Bell Hooks was the person who was the most out feminist. Oh, I don't care where she was and what she's, she named herself a feminist. And she was, you know, put into that category. So it was really hard. I, I share this with my students. You know, now every, anybody can say they're feminists and the community is not going to demonize you. And so I started, collect, so for me, it's Words of Fire, my favorite book of mine, because it's an anthology. So I started collecting while I was uh, uh, doing a, the PhD at Emory and I had no issues did a dissertation on attitudes toward black women, 1880 to 1920. And I discovered Anna Julia Cooper in the library while I, I'm a doctoral student at Emory. I mean, I literally my, put my hand up there and here came a voice from the South. And I sat there and I read it. And, it, and I asked myself, why have I never heard of Anna Julia Cooper? You know, okay. So I started collecting black feminist writing because I wanted, I was just sick of people saying, why are you calling yourself a feminist? Feminism is white and blah, blah, blah. So, Bell Hooks and I, Gloria and I would talk about that all the time. We need to establish that black women and some men have been feminists. Going back to Mariah Stewart in 1835. And so for me, Bell, the, um, Words of fire and our conversations and our experiences as an out feminist made me say, if I don't do anything else in life, I want to do this anthology that traces our feminist thinking, theorizing, uh, and that's the impact that her work and many other Black women's work had on me. And I, I'm going to, I'm mentioning one other thing which people don't know. Bell Hooks couldn't get her dissertation on. Toni Morrison published. Right. Okay, she, she she had a PhD in English and she could never get her dissertation on uh, Toni Morrison published. So I just wanted, and she, and she, you know, we would talk about that. You know, now we can't imagine because Toni Morrison has become Toni Morrison, but anyway, it was words of fire. Mm -hmm. And she, isn't it, that's the, that's the story because on Our Women is her first book, right? Mm -hmm. That she started writing when she was an undergraduate she was at an Stanford. Undergrad. Because she couldn't get the Morrison book published. 
So you you want to know why some of us say she's a genius? She couldn't get her dissertation published. The the work she started doing as an undergraduate ended up becoming her first book, right. which is Aren't I a Woman, which is about Black women's relationship, long history mm -hmm. to feminism, and really, again, is a classic. Mm -hmm. It's a classic text. Um, not That's not the norm. Not everybody is pulling it. I mean, I got brilliant students, but they're not sort of pulling out uh, papers <laughs> that they're going to turn into iconic texts so far, so far. <laughs> So here we are celebrating um, Belle and Lonnie, and the fear was that she would be forgotten, as it was mentioned a little bit earlier, um, the way that Zora um, had been forgotten for so many years. Um, what kinds of things beyond um, a symposium can institutions do um, to ensure that, that Belle um, not only um, continues and is introduced to new generations, but also um, is amplified more in the academy and outside the academy. Well, one thing I'll say is that we could have the endowed chair, endowed bell hooks chair. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have at Spelman the endowed queer study, Audre Lorde queer studies chair. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that means that Audrey Lord's name is out there. The other thing that we do every year, which we've done for almost 20 years, right. mm -hmm. is have an annual Tony K. Bambara. Mm, that's we, right. Every, I mean, I, I don't think, I think I'm not incorrect. We're the only college that I know of that every year mm. calls the name and celebrates a radical mm. feminist writer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can so we so that we can do that. We can have endowed professorships. That's just one little quick thing right. that we could do. Right. No, I think that's right. But I think it's tied to a larger problem of the invisibility of black women, right? Yeah. I mean, holding up bell hooks because she's a genius and everybody should hold her up. Um, but it's almost that she survived and and made a trail through these elite institutions mm -hmm. um, that she was like chopping down brush in order to walk on the path. Mm -hmm. um, and at these institutions, when you talk to black women, generally the, the handful that are, I mean, we're some tiny percentage of tenured professors and then full professors, it's, you know, smaller still. Um, and you talk to black student, black women students, um, to, to, we're not doing well. We're, we're, we're just not doing well. You will, people will not tell you they necessarily feel they're flourishing. We might be well paid, um, but people will not necessarily, well, you work in D, like, you know. <laughs> so, 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 so let's unpack that a little bit when you say we're not doing well and we know that, right? What, what needs to happen? But I'm asking from your perspective. So let's turn the mic on you because this is in your lane, right? Like you do diversity, equity, and inclusion Absolutely. here. And you you get wind of what's happening with black like when they when they want when we want to be vocal, when we decide we want to stick our heads up and actually talk about it with someone. So you, we know that when you stick your head up and you talk about it, you you sometimes are labeled. Um, um, sometimes you're put in a, a category um, um, of the, the troublemaker, or sometimes you have a problem advancing um, to that next level, but it should not stop you. Right. Um, and um, I think that faculty members are freer um, than administrators mm -hmm. in terms of being able to do that. Mm -hmm. But it's something Rebecca I'm not sure, um, said earlier that some you have to find your voice and you have to kind of step out there. Mm -hmm. um, but we're at a point, we're at an inflection point um, where it's going to take the faculty, it's going to take the collaboration with administrators to um, speak up and, and, and hold people accountable. Because the thing that's difficult in higher education about DEI, it's not the diversity, it's not the inclusion, it's the equity. Mm 
Mm. Yes. You know, people will mm. always talk about um, diversity representation and we'll talk about inclusion, making sure that, you know, you feel like you belong. But what's the equity? And sometimes, well, not sometimes, always with equity, you have to do um, provide some people with a little bit more um, to level the playing field. And I don't think institutions um, are postured to do that. I think that there are just too many elements um, that um, that make people, um, I need to be very careful how I say that. There are too many um, um, times that if you do provide something for someone else, other people will pop their head up and people don't want to put themselves, I don't want to say leadership, but don't want to put themselves in a position um, to um, be saying that, you know, you're being unfair. Well, I think the first thing, um, you know, I think you made a good point, but again, I think these two incredible women that we've been talking about will argue, we have to look really hard at the truth of the matter. Yeah. Uh, equity in American higher education is an aspiration. Yes. Mm. Yes. It has never been a reality. Yeah. And therefore, everybody needs to get really clear mm -hmm. that I don't know institutions. We have a huge variety of, of institutions in this country. And I just want to talk about the, the ones that I know best. Uh, there was nev never equity in those institutions. Never. It, it, salary equity, mm -hmm. uh, equity around uh, commitments to service, mm -hmm. uh, oh. teaching loads, mm -hmm. all of those kinds of, those kind of metrics. No, there were always people who were, um, and there continue to be people who are going to do uh, a, a, a really huge amount of teaching because that was their strength. That's what they wanted to do. And they were allowed to do it, which did not mean that everybody else was asked to do the same thing. And it also meant that people who, um, who felt like their the, the lane they wanted to be in was to become a big public intellectual and garner a great deal of attention for their work and then be reimbursed for the attention the fact that they had become big public intellectuals. There's a whole host of things about it, but I mean, just, if anybody thinks that in in, in these institutions that, that that it looks like this room where all the chairs are the same size in 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 equal length rows, no, that's not what it was. And in fact, the infusion, the the, in, the more women and people of color have come in the institutions has made it clear that the rows are not straight and the seats are not the same size. And there are a lot of people who don't like the fact that that is now visible. And so equity becomes something that really speaks, will speak directly to who has power and who doesn't have power. Um, and as uh, the time that I was senior vice provost for faculty development and diversity at Harvard was the first time I really learned that the seat, it's not just, the seats were the same size. There were really, really big seats and really, really <laughs> tiny seats among the same faculty. And it's like, oh, who knew? Who knew? It was never that, I mean, everybody understood it, but it was never visible. So making it visible has upset a lot of people. And, and so the people with those really, really big chairs, you, when, you, when you're trying to tell me I gotta, I'm gonna have to go, I'm gonna have to go sit with one that's the same, no, no, not going there. Not going to go and sit in one of those small chairs. So what are you going to do to make them go sit in a small chair None. and be a chair it's the same size as everybody else's, or almost everybody else's chair? That's the struggle. It's a struggle now for where's the commitment to equity? I, 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 I let me say, I got to say this. There's, and this is what always gets me in trouble. Uh oh. There's no equity in HBCUs. Oh, either. I know. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I know there is no equity. Yeah. Most of our of black mm -hmm. colleges have had male presidents. Yep. There's no equity if you're queer. Okay, I mean, I can name all of the stuff, but we never talk about equity. And this is why I like Bell Hooks. A lot of her criticism was, was oh, intra-racial. Right. We never right. talk about these issues. We always talk about majority institutions. Yep. You wouldn't dare do, say what I just said. Right. There right. is no equity in higher education, period. Right, mm -hmm. right, that's right. That's right. Agreed. Well, okay. To, okay. I'm going to have to. I'm, you guys can keep talking, but I do have to catch a plane. I'm sorry. 
And we need to work okay. on that. Any, any quick questions? I know Evelyn's got to go. Any quick questions for Evelyn before she has to? Any quick questions for anyone? You're about tired. Oh, bless, you. bless you. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, and thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Are we done? Yeah. Yay. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Yeah. No, 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 no. I... <laughs>